Hello and welcome to the Dorkomotive Podcast with Brian Loans. On this episode, we tell the incredible story of America's greatest backyard hot rodder, Art Arfons, a man who built drag racing cars and later land speed racing cars that reset records, ran close to 600 miles per hour, and rewrote the idea of what was possible with your own two hands and your own brilliant ideas. This is the story of a true American original. This episode of the Dorkomotive Podcast is being presented by Nitroactive.net. Nitroactive.net carries the best in nostalgia West Coast drag strip t-shirts as well as hot rod and car culture t-shirts from places like Moon Eyes, Laid Back, Lucky 13, SoCal Speed Shop, Hollywood Hot Rods, and more. They also have a massive inventory of vintage collectible hot rod, car craft, hop-up, popular hot rodding, drag racing, super stock, and drag illustrated magazines, as well as classic and vintage photos. Visit NitroActive.net for all your vintage hot rod and drag racing needs. Use promo code DORK and check out and save 10% on your next purchase at NitroActive.net. Our Fonz is buckled into the cockpit. Finally, he checked. All conditions go. A new record by our fonts, 536 and three quarter miles per hour. It was the ugliest land speed vehicle ever seen at the Bonneville Salt Flats, a monster built in a junk littered Akron garage by a self educated hot rodder. Beside Craig Breedlove's sleek three wheel jet racer Spirit of America, it looked as ungainly as a garbage truck. By contrast with Donald Campbell's multi million dollar British Bluebird, it was built for nickels and dimes. But for Arthur Eugene Arfons of Akron's Pickle Road, his appropriately named Green Monster, was purely lovely. Art Arfons is a breed dear to the American heart, the poor boy who makes good on his own. His achievement is more remarkable for its audacity. In this sophisticated age, we have grown accustomed to technical advances as the product of lavishly financed research teamwork. Arfons thought Green Monster out for himself, and he built it of scrap. A tall, smiling 38-year-old of Greek descent, Arfons has always been a special kind of hot rodder. He hit the drag strips 10 years ago, not with automotive power, but with the punch of a P-38 fighter engine. Then haunted surplus yards for bargain buys and jet engines. For years, Bonneville regarded him as a shoestring sort, with as much gall as go. With bits and pieces of salvage, Arfons assembled the chassis and controls. Then he loaded the monster into a nondescript bus, also reclaimed from the scrap heap, and headed west. Arfons had to wait until his brother's car had performed. When it came his turn, he easily beat Walt's 413 mile an hour speed with runs averaging 434. The next day he blew his right rear tire trying for 500. Darn it, he said. What counts is who's ahead when the season ends. Breelove can beat me. If he does, I'll be back. Thus begins our telling of the story of Art Arfons, and to some degree the story of Walter Arfons' half-brother. Art Arfons, in my estimation, is the greatest backyard hot rodder that has ever lived and likely ever will live. And through the telling of this story, not just from the words of great authors and writers like the ones I just shared, written by Hayes Gorey, a man who penned those words in the November 9, 1964 issue of Sports Illustrated magazine, celebrating the fact that Art Arfons had reclaimed for himself, or had claimed for himself, the world's land speed record of 434 miles an hour. Through the years 1964 and 1965 and into 1966, R. Arfons and Craig Breedlove would engage in one of the most famous racing battles in American history, trading the land speed record back and forth almost a half dozen times. It is craziness, it is incredible courage, and it's the story of a man who was an empirical genius. Art Arfons was the type of person that could visualize a solution to a problem that others would attack in a very methodical measured way by doing mathematics and studying physics and Art Arfons could see things in his mind that other people needed to figure out mathematically or mechanically. Arfons figured them out with his hands. He was 
an amazing guy, someone whose story is going to be told not just by me and not just by these words, but by people like Humpy Wheeler, who is a guest on this show, by people like Brett Kepner, a drag racing historian, by people like Tim Arfons, his son, and by people like Samuel Hawley, an author who wrote the definitive book on the battle between Craig Breedlove and Art Arfons on the Bonneville Salt Flats in the middle 1960s. Arfon stands as a personal hero to me, and by the end of this show, I feel as though he may stand as a personal hero to you. He is a man of depth, he is a man of great interest, and he's a man whose story will be told from several different angles. One of the things that was mentioned in the piece I was reading from to open the show, written by Hayes Gorey out of Sports Illustrated, was the fact that Art had a brother, actually a half-brother named Walt, and Walt, just days before Art's 434-mile-an-hour triumph, had taken the land speed record himself at a slower speed. We need to introduce Walter Arfons to this story. Walter Arfons will be a central player in this discussion going forward. His relationship with his brother, his own accomplishments on Bonneville, have set him apart in the world of not only drag racing history, but also land speed racing history. Let us continue to tell our tale. We go back now to the world of Sports Illustrated in 1964, another story written by Hayes Gorey entitled Two Old Shoestringers Jolt the Jet Set. It had been this way for six days. Wingfoot Express, a home-designed hot rod built by Walter Arfons, had swept back and forth over the flats 14 times, reaching a top speed of just 313 miles an hour. That would be fine for the family Chevy, but on the Utah Salt, when the world land speed record is the goal, no one takes a man or a car seriously at much less than 400 miles per hour. Wingfoot Express balked stubbornly until nearly everyone had written it off. Then two hours before sunset, on the last day reserved for it on the salt this year, the jet woke up the timers. Like an underslung missile mounted on wheels, it roared south to north, entering the measured mile and left it seconds later. The speed was an encouraging 406.5 miles per hour. Minutes later, it came the other way at 420.07, the fastest mile ever recorded on land. The average speed of 413.2 broke the record of 407.6 established last year by Craig Breelove. I never thought Walt would do it, whispered a local mechanic. Maybe his brother Art, but not Walt. Well, who did? Walt is Walter Arfons of Akron, who built the car with the help of Tom Green of Wheaton, Illinois, who is the driver. A 47-year-old one-time feed mill operator, Walter Arfons and his brother began tinkering with jet cars and racing dragsters 10 years ago, each of them eventually using a separate part of the old mill as his garage, and each of them going his own hot-rodding way. The Know Something said that Art had a hot car this year, but that poor Walt, no longer able to drive because of a heart attack, did not. Walt's wing foot, they said, was a slew foot. Driver Tom Green is an engineer at P.A. Sturdivant Company in Elmhurst, Illinois. He met Arfons in 1962 when they were both attending a car show in Chicago. We talked about cars for a few minutes, remembers Green, and we seemed to realize that each of us had what the other lacked. I don't know one end of a jet engine from the other. Walt said he knew very little about my specialty, aerodynamics. As soon as Walt Arfons got back to Akron, work began on Wingfoot. Green had a full-time job he wanted to keep, but Arfons was now making his living building, selling, and racing cars. His avocation was his vocation. The two built the Wingfoot Express via correspondence. Arfons worked on the steel frame and engine at his garage in Akron. There isn't a part in that crate that isn't handmade. Axles, ducks, everything, says Arfons. By mail, Green was exacting in his requests. The rear wheels must be farther apart than the front wheels. The weight must be toward the rear, and above all, keep it low, low, low. Green had decided that the trouble with Donald Campbell's $4 million Bluebird was its huge wheels. I knew enough about aerodynamics to know that you wanted a small car for land speed record runs. We had narrow in mind. Weight and fin and feathers in the rear, tapering almost to a point in the front. That summer, Wingfoot was taken to the salt flats where trouble of a different sort plagued it. The huge engine was ingesting salt. The faster it went, the more salt it swallowed. Its top speed was only 315 miles an hour, but Goodyear, their sponsor, was game again to try in 1964. After trial runs on Sunday, Arfons and Green pronounced the car ready. On Monday, it ran well, but slowly. The motor just didn't have it, said Green. We'll put a new one in, promised Walt. Ho-hum. On Tuesday, there was no new motor, and in trial runs, Wingfoot never got near 300. It was the same on Wednesday. By Thursday, the new motor was installed, but crosswinds swept the flats. All day, the timers waited and waited. Nobody did anything at all except the Green wiped dust and salt off of Wingfoot's blue body now and again. Arfons picked up a wrench and moved in on it, only to back away sheepishly as everyone knew 
he really had no bolts in need of tightening. Friday, the last available day, was still windy, and the wing foot was still bulky. Green wiggled his 5 foot 11 inches into the cockpit and roared down the course. It was 4.06 p.m. Green, steering with one hand, pumped the lever with the other, and the afterburner fired. It went zoom, zoom, zoom. That's the only way I can describe it. The airspeed indicator told me I was going 440, but I didn't use the afterburner enough in the measured mile. After I popped the chutes, they told me my official speed was only 406. Wingfoot roared into the measured mile again. This trip, Green fired the afterburner three times, and the spurts were enough. The record fell. You know, Green exalted moments later, this car handles better at 400 than at 200. It has the power for 500, and now I wonder what the limit of speed on land may be. I don't think 700 miles per hour is out of the question. Walter Arfons listened intently as Green described the noisy life inside Wingfoot at 400-plus miles an hour. It rattles a lot, he said, and those little irregularities in the salt, you feel every single one of them. You sort of get the feeling that you're inside a rocket that's rattling around on the ground. We can go on better than just reading Tom Green's quotes of driving this race car. This is what Tom Green had to say about his trip of setting the world land speed record was like in the Wingfoot Express in 1964. A third challenger, Tom Green, wanted to take on Breedlove and Arfons. He was a trained engineer and had a deep understanding of aerodynamics. I would say predominantly I learned what engineering I knew and what aerodynamics I knew in the service, uh, having been educated at White Sands Proving Grounds, where we fired the last of the captured B-2 rockets. I was sitting there the last day that we were allowed to try for the record, and I thought to myself, am I going to have to come back here next year and go through all this again? Heck no, I'm going for it. I can tell you, and I'll remember the rest of my life. I knew I had to apply more power, so I left the afterburner on longer. The airspeed of the indicator was traveling this fast, over 400 miles an hour, and wasn't slowing down. I had the most tremendous feeling of power that I've ever had, or that I'll ever have. Tom Green was the first man to set the new Jet Unlimited record of 413 miles per hour. After I beat the record, all the other fellows who had had so much of an experience with speed thought, well, if this guy can go out and break it, certainly I can, and they all did. <laughs> Green's laugh really tells a the tale there at the end and how kind of absurd things would get in a very short amount of time. His 413 mile an hour speed would be viewed as quaint within months of it actually being run, actually within days of it being run, because it would be Walt's half-brother, Art, a man who he had a very contentious and strange relationship with that we'll get into a little bit later in the show that would take that 413-mile-an-hour record and smash it into the salt just a few days later. But before we go ahead with the Bonneville side of things, we need to get up to speed as to how we got to this point. How did these two brothers, how did these two guys from Akron, Ohio, turn themselves into national speed heroes? How do they end up with sponsorships from Goodyear and Firestone? How did they end up becoming featured in Sports Illustrated magazine? It all started for them on the drag strips of America, and it all started in the same way their land speed records and racing would progress. Their drag racing did it the same way. They were very inventive. They spent very little money. They used their own hands and brilliance to build their machines. The Arfons brothers revolutionized drag racing and then were basically thrown out of the sport, for lack of a better term. How and why? For those answers, we'll turn to Brett Kepner, a drag racing historian, who will give us a great history on the Arfons brothers in the world of straight line drag strip competition. So as we talk about Art Arfons coming onto the salt, and we talk about Art Arfons in this moment taking Walt Arfons' uh, land speed record away, we can really get a fill in the story here of how not just Walter, but how Art got from the drag strips primarily to the salt. And for that reason, we're speaking to Brett Kepner, drag racing historian, land speed racing historian. And Brett, you know, Art Arfons, uh, his, his specter grows immensely here during this period in 64, and then it really explodes in 65. But the guy really made his bones on the drag strip. So I need to talk to you to figure out how we got from these guys in Akron that had this weird little three-wheeled contraption and then built some airplane power dragsters to this moment when the guy's challenging for the land speed record. 
Well, is it, 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 it's really an interesting story because the Arfons brothers, whether you want to talk about Art and Walt or Walt or Art separately, uh, pretty much got kicked out of the sport repeatedly by the National Hot Rod Association. <laughs> one time, one of those instances was kind of understandable. Uh, the second time was kind of blindsided, and it forced both of them to at least think of something else outside of drag racing to do, and that's where the Bonneville situation came in. The amazing thing about the Arfons family is they had already, they're, they're all known for the Green Monster name, uh, which originally came when Walt and Art were still talking. Uh, when they they literally weren't talking after 1960, but uh, when they were truly a brother act, uh, they named all their machines Green Monster. Uh, the the legend starts that uh, that's the only color paint they had laying around, so they painted it green. Uh, the, the very first Green Monster, uh, they painted it green, took it to their first drag racing event, which was uh, a very obscure little place but a very important place in the history of drag racing and that is the access road directly in front of uh the soapbox derby finals arena in akron ohio did that make any sense it, it totally made sense yeah uh, okay there is, is a little road that went to the big arena where all the kids who won their local soapbox derbies met to determine the national champion and it was called Derby Downs. And the Derby Downs access road became a drag strip, a, not, not an illegal one, a functioning, supervised, uh, for-profit drag strip in 1952. And that's when the Arfons brothers first went racing, because it was literally right down the road. And they said, hey, let's go see. I think their first one was a, was it a six-cylinder car? It was a, an Oldsmobile six-cylinder three-wheeler. Yeah. Yeah, right. They said, let's see what this thing will do. Uh, they painted it green, and the announcer referred to it as the Green Monster, and the name stuck. That's that's literally where the whole mess came from. So they painted every successive vehicle green. My point was, they started in 1952. By 1959, they were already up to Green Monster number 20. Number 20. Uh, and as you're well aware, the the line of cars that they created had every conceivable type of engines from uh, Ranger aircraft engines to, of course, the Allison aircraft engine that they became popularly known for. Um, a variety of car engines, a variety of thrust uh, vehicles, including one with a propeller. Uh, just an incredible array of cars. And they, they ran them as a brother team all the way up until 1959. In 1959, the National Hot Rod Association went to Detroit Dragway for their U.S. Nationals. Uh, that was a big deal. You know, they had gone from Great Bend, Kansas, to Kansas City, to Oklahoma City, and then they got a deal to race in front of what they considered automotive royalty. Uh, I'm talking about the NHRA now, not sure. the Arfons Brothers. Uh, NHRA decided if we, or NHRA figured if they can run in front of the big wigs in Detroit, they'll get all kinds of response. Well, guess what? They were absolutely correct. They did. But Art Arfons showed up with the Allison V12 aircraft engine powered green monster and set top speed of the meet. And after the end of that race, the National Highway Association said, we don't need to show Detroit that the fastest thing out there is what was then a 20 year old P51 Mustang engine. Uh, nobody's buying them. Nobody's selling them. <laughs> right. Uh, so they dropped all references to non-automotive engines from their rule book. And after that, you never saw another aircraft engine in, in an HRA drag racing. And it's important for the listeners to understand, this is a wheel-driven car. Uh, for the hardcores, it's probably interesting to remember that this is a wheel-driven car on pump gasoline, uh, which, you know, was the rules uh, for the National Opera Association at the time. Okay, so that takes us up through 1959, uh, but it also takes us up to the first time that the Arfons brothers got kicked in the groin uh, and said, uh, hey, all that cool stuff that you guys have, it's no longer late. They still had a tremendous match race business. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that time, it wasn't really even a match race business. It was a single run business. 
uh, the, the Green Monster would be booked into a local track to simply come out and make a couple of laps. It was that incredible of a vehicle. Uh, on rare occasions, it would be run against gas dragsters uh, of the conventional kind. But you have to remember that Arfons was the fastest gas-burning car that NHRA had. He was running 178 miles an hour in 1959. Yeah, that's insane. And, yeah, and uh, if we had 60-foot clocks back then, I promise you, if you've ever yeah. seen video of this car, it wasn't covering the first 60 feet in less than two seconds. It oh, no, it, it is like a school bus coming off the starting line. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great analogy. It really was. So anyway, they had this, this good uh, match race business going, and they continued that after NHRA let them go. They, they actually helped them a little bit from the standpoint of the outlaw uh, persona. But unfortunately, 1960 was a big year for fuel burning dragsters in that they ran over 200 miles per hour and at least one did well actually uh, more than one did nitro cars you know owned the match race scene no, nobody was really booking in the howard cams twin bear right uh it, it was the nhra champion but it, it nobody's booking it in okay so what happened at the end of 1959 there, there's two things that happened there's the what we know happened and there's what we don't know happened what we know happened is all of a sudden Art and Walt stopped talking. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot of other people on this show that have far greater knowledge uh, about that situation than I. And I can promise you, uh, having worked with Art and Dusty and uh, the whole Arfons Tim and the, the whole Arfons family for a number of years in the indoor world uh, and Bonneville, um, have to remember he came back in the late 80s yes to bonneville uh, anyway having worked with them i never had the guts to bring it up I, I don't have any idea what happened okay well there you go so i won't spend any more time on that so for whatever reason they stopped talking so i'm just going to go with gut instincts here I, I would appreciate your gut instinct because you have no more than anybody else or no less than anybody else in this situation what made them branch out into the areas that they did i can only imagine walt was looking to one-up his brother. When yeah. in 1960, he devised a plan to build a Westinghouse J47 jet engine on four wheels with a steering wheel. So Walt builds the very first green monster jet car. He drives it, which is something that he hadn't done in quite a few years of drag racing. Uh, it made its debut July 30th, 1960 at Union Grove, Wisconsin. It was... Uh, the track operator, Broadway Bob Metzler, hyped it to the point where he had the governor there to see this thing. Now, now keep in mind, Broadway knew that having the governor there would force a lot of other people to come see this thing because the governor's there. But either way, it was that big of a deal. Uh, unfortunately, the car ran exactly like any jet car you, I, or any of our listeners have ever seen when it has a flame out. The car didn't have an afterburner, so, or the engine didn't have an afterburner. So it ran as a pure jet engine. And if anybody's ever seen a modern day jet car have a flame out, it's pretty unimpressive. Now, now don't get me wrong. Uh, nobody had ever seen a jet engine on a car. Most people had never stood that close to a jet engine running. So it was still an amazing incident, an amazing sight, but it, it wasn't fast. That was the problem. Uh, Arfons worked all through 1960. Let me rephrase that. Walt worked all through 1960 getting that thing fixed uh he hired a driver a guy named nook bakewell uh yes n-o-o-k bakewell it's his honest to god name he was a, a gym teacher from Akron, uh to drive the thing uh that started the last week of september in 1960 they, they never got the car over 145 miles an hour at any track and they ran everywhere from union grove wisconsin to lions at uh, in los angeles to east coast tracks they ran it everywhere to florida at the same time that they were out there doing that, getting a lot of ink only because it was such an odd vehicle, not because they were setting records. Art was back in Akron with the, the same configuration they had last run in drag racing, that being a rear engine Allison V12 rear wheel drive vehicle. And with only slight modifications, was building that car to go to Bonneville. And this would he be the did. car. This would be the car known as the Anteater, right? With that, we had Correct. a fully enclosed body on it, and a really odd nose that poked out of the front of it, which of course made it look like an Anteater. Hence the name. The only real difference between the drag racing uh, uh, Green Monster and the Anteater 
was wheelbase. Uh, he, he lengthened the wheelbase on the Bonneville car, and the driver was moved to in front of the front axle, which was very weird at the time. Um, okay, so we go to 1961, and several things happen in 1961. First, Walt gets an afterburner, and in a very short amount of time, gets the afterburner working to the point that if you want to drop the premise that Karamasinas, Chris Karamasinas was the first over 200 in 1960, if you want to drop the premise that Don Garlitz, who also got 200 mile an hour clockings in 1960, did never happen, if you want to drop the premise that Kent Chateaugnier did not go to one night, I'm sorry, did not go 197, 200, and 201 at Houston 1960, or any of the other bogus 200s, or not bogus 200s, if you want to get rid of them, then Nook Makewell was the first man over 200 miles per hour in drag racing, also in the first and the sevens, I might add, uh, when he ran 777 at 213 miles an hour in Fontana, California, in the jet-powered green monster in 1960, in July. That made that car larger than life. That made Walt Arfon's green monster the most sought-after vehicle in all all of drag racing possibly in all of motorsports it, it didn't even it wasn't even just booked in at drag strips it was booked in at county fairs it was booked in at car shows it was booked in everywhere it was a rolling printing press of money meanwhile in 1961 art takes the anteater to bonneville there's no specific class in it for it in the scta but walt was only there to basically threaten the world land speed record yeah, he was he was chasing Cobb like everybody else. Uh, no, he was actually chasing Mickey Thompson, 406, one way. I don't even think Art Arfons cared about setting a two-way record. I think he just wanted to go out and go 407, to be honest with you. The Anteater ran 313, surprised a lot of people. And it, it only did it one way, but uh, it did go 313 miles an hour. That was top speed of the meet for Bonneville 1961. That was That's a huge deal. Wow. Uh, so suddenly our Arfons gets a little ink. Now, the, the interesting thing there is something you and I talk about a lot. Uh, Walt got all kinds of ink in trade publications with the Green Monster. Art got all kinds of AP ink in the Anteater. AP ink being uh, idiot speak for, for articles in straight newspapers, mainstream news stuff crazy radical airplane powered car goes 313 at Bonneville at Salt Flats uh, kind of headline. So at the end of 61, they were both big news, but then something weird happens in 1962. Art decides he needs a jet powered dragster. You don't say. Walt Arfons, beginning in July of 1960, either with Nook Bakewell driving or Doug Rose driving, uh, who took over for Nook in 1962. Walt Arfon's Green Monster was the first over 200, the first in the sevens, the first over 210, the first over 220, the first over 230. The car later, this is after the whole time frame that you and I are even talking about, but the car later became the first over 250 and the first over 260. It also became the first over 270, 271 miles an hour at Wall Dragway in San Angelo, Texas in 1965. So... The Green Monster of Walt Arfons was the dominant performance vehicle of the 1960s. Unfortunately, most people immediately classified the jets uh, in the folder marked something else. Uh, you know, it was never, never did those, did the, did the jet cars get spoken about in the same breath performance-wise now as a wheel-driven car. So in 1962, Art Arfons, for some reason, again, we can speculate, but we don't, we do not know, decides to build a jet dragster, and what does he name it? The Green Monster. You talk about a cluster. Uh, I can't tell you how many straight newspaper articles said that the local drag strip was going to have Walt Arfon's Green Monster when, in fact, it had Art Arfon's Green Monster or vice versa. Uh, and it makes things really difficult for the few psychopaths who care about keeping track of those records. But he actually, somewhere along the line, it was fairly early, too. I want to say no later than, than June of 1960. Art Arfon's finally got some semblance of uh, of sense and 
made the car different. It was still called the Green Monster, but do you know what it was called? Cyclops. You know why it was called Cyclops? Aircraft landing light in the nose that he used to see where the hell he was going at 230 miles an hour at some of the worst drag strips ever built. Uh, and he would stage the car, and he would turn on the light. Uh, so let's refer from that point on to, Walt Arf uh, to Art Arfon's driving Cyclops. Um, Art, beginning in 1962, instantly became the first six-second car. He would later become the first five-second jet car, although he was beat into the fives by the X-1. And, you know, Art, Art was one of the last to run the J-79. Uh, at that point, Arfons spends 1962 racing uh, a very lucrative match race schedule in drag racing, but he also took that car to Bonneville. Very few people realize that Art Arafons ran the Cyclops at Bonneville in 62, uh, and the car went 330, you know, and un unchanged from his drag racing uh, configuration. It went 330 miles an hour. Open cockpit, <laughs> 330 miles an hour. Absolutely. Goes to Bonneville in 1962. The car goes 330, and Art starts explaining uh, in his weekly chats with uh, the local newspaper guy, uh, you know, every track they go to, their feature material, uh, if only because they want to talk to somebody who's gone 330 miles an hour. Art starts explaining to the local news uh, reporters that he's going to Bonneville and he's going to set the record. That's when he really starts directing his efforts towards Bonneville, but he's still racing the drag car. So is Walt. You know, the other green monster is still active and racing everywhere. Uh, and it would be until 1966 uh, with Doug Rose driving. You know, the interesting thing about post Bonneville Art Arfons is the fact that once he got the Bonneville car built and, you know, went out and, you know, increased the speed record uh, marginally uh, over a period of two years, repeatedly, but marginally. Uh, that's the car that he eventually took back to the drag strip. Uh, amazing story. True, true American heroes, you know, absolutely did every single thing he ever did without any help from anybody. Uh, talk, you want to talk about garage mechanics? Nothing will ever come close to the Arfon Brothers. This episode of the Dorkomotive Podcast is being presented by Nitroactive.net. Nitroactive.net carries the best in nostalgia West Coast drag strip t-shirts as well as hot rod and car culture t-shirts from places like Moon Eyes, Laid Back, Lucky 13, SoCal Speed Shop, Hollywood Hot Rods, and more. They also have a massive inventory of vintage collectible hot rod, car craft, hop-up, popular hot rodding, drag racing, super stock, and drag illustrated magazines, as well as classic and vintage photos. Visit nitroactive.net for all your vintage hot rod and drag racing needs. Use promo code DORK and check out and save 10% on your next purchase at nitroactive.net. So now that we have learned about what's going on as far as the brothers' history in drag racing, we've taken you up to the minute where Walter Arfons has set the land speed record of the world, and we have set up the fact that his brother, Art, is soon to snatch it away. It is a family rivalry that we'll get into a little bit later in the show, but there is one part of this family that we need to talk to because it is a link that we can question and we can quiz about what life was like during this period where Art Arfons is rapidly becoming one of the most famous people in the world. To give us some incredibly unique perspective on this time and this man, his son Tim. I guess my first question is, you know, what was Art Arfons like as a dad? I mean, obviously, you know, you kind of you kind of caught the same bug he did with your career in drag racing and tractor pulling and, and the Akron Turbine Group, but what was he like as, as a dad on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, he was at the shop a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he never saw me play a sport, uh, he had no interest in any of that stuff. And uh, that, I mean, if I wanted to see him, I went to the shop where I traveled with him. He was not home that much. And in terms of being a 10 year old kid, basically, because you were born in 55, right? So you were like 10, year, you were like 10 years old at the height of all this stuff that was going on at Bonneville when he was going, you know, back and forth with breed love. I guess, you know, from what I've read, he would, he would call home once a day or once a week. I mean, how did you keep in contact with him when he was out there? And then I guess, what was the after effect like when he'd come home after grabbing the record? He, well, he wouldn't be home much. Firestone had him, when he had the record, he was on a PR tour. So he, he was, he was, uh, yes, he, he called home every day when he was at Bonneville. 
when he when he drag raced, you know, in the early days, he had a code with my mom, and he, you know, he'd place a uh, collect call, <laughs> and depending on who the name was, it was if everything was okay or there'd been problems or something, so he had the code for that. <laughs> oh, so she didn't have to ex- accept the charges. It would yeah, be. You know, <laughs> oh, that's pretty amazing. And and you know, to me, that's one of the neatest parts about his story. I guess the guy, he he was so I don't want to say thrifty, but he really was. I mean, he was he was such the foil for Craig Breedlove, completely opposite oh, in so Lord, many ways. Yeah. You know, you couldn't have scripted a guy that would that would be the opposite of Breedlove like your dad. No, and that was one of the worst parts of growing up as his son because my first job was sorting bolts, and I. <laughs> That's got to be the absolute worst job in the world, and I have never made anybody do that. <laughs> so you would just sit there with buckets of bolts in front of you and just have to, oh, have to set them in piles? Buckets of bolts of 12.1032 bolts, that, and you had to make sure, you know, some were a half inch long, some were five eighths, some were three quarters, and after several hours, they all looked the same. <laughs> I guess, as you mentioned, you know, he was a guy that just worked constantly. Um, was there any ever any let up? I mean, in terms of th- there was, quote unquote, an off season of land speed racing in the winter. But I'm sure that was when the car was completely disassembled. And he probably worked twice as hard during that time of the year. No, he had other projects going. I mean, you know, he still had Cyclops. He was still running the uh, drag strips. And when he had the record, we actually uh, he started building the duck. Okay. And after the dud, he was working on the, you know, turning Cyclops into a boat to go after the water record. Yeah, and that's an insane kind of looking contraption if I've ever seen it. The photos of the of basically he took the car and set it on sponsons, right? And then I, right. my understanding is that it did not go quite according to plan. No, the, the idea was great. I mean, he was going to get, when it got up to about 150 mile an hour, I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures, there were tires on it. It yes. was going to come up on tires. That's, I guess with the surface tension of the water, I guess it's probably almost like concrete at those speeds. That... Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it would have been a good idea, but it, the boat was too heavy and it would nose over. He, he screwed an engine up and said that was it. He was done. It ingested some water or something? or just? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it ingested a lot of water and, and run the compressor. As you're, you know, when you're a kid and you obviously you learned your way around these turbine engines, it's how you make your living these days. Uh, when did you really start to get hands on beyond the bolt sorting process? Oh, it wasn't that much longer, probably 12, okay. 13. I was running a lathe in a mill. He uh, he would just tell me, you know, he cut his own splines for everything. So I would be running a turntable and he'd just say, you know, crank this four times, run it up and down. When you're done, turn it another four times, do it again. <laughs> Yeah, and, and he was, I'm guessing just by his nature, he was probably a pretty straightforward teacher. And probably not a guy you wanted to make a lot of mistakes around, if I had to guess, as a kid. No, no. He, he's way better at that than I, I am to other people. He was very forgiving on that part of it. Oh, that's not great. Hard on, he was never hard on me on that at all. That's actually really cool. And, uh, yeah. you know, when you guys were out pulling... Um, which it's it, your dad's career is so interesting to me because obviously the land speed stuff made him first of all drag racing made him nationally famous in the mid 50s when he goes out there and and wins the world series of uh, of drag racing in 54 right. and 55 that really establishes who he is he makes a successful business on the drag racing side then the land speed stuff comes up and the tractor pulling thing is such an interesting part of him and it's an interesting thing to me because so many drag racers and speed guys end up in tractor pulling guys like Ken Venny and others what yep. was was the attraction simply the fact that it was just a new mechanical challenge? I mean, what was the attraction of tractor pulling? It's it's hard to say. Well, you were closer. You got to do it more often. Um, it was a lot more work, I'll tell you that, because back <laughs> in the day, you know, you ran multiple weight classes. So there was nothing. You know, you ran a 5, a 7, a 9, and a 12. So it's, in between classes, sometimes you're adding 7,000 pounds to the vehicle. Wow. So it was a lot more work, but it was so much horsepower in such a small area. Yeah. You know, the track-wise. Yeah. And, and, and there was a lot of, in the early, now drag race, uh, tractor pulling now today is almost like drag racing. Back in the day, though, with the heavier sleds, it was a lot of driving to it. Okay. Now it's just wheel speed. Yeah, I mean, just watching the old videos and, you, and the and the the machinery acts so much different. And I, I guess I never realized the difference in the sleds. I mean, I knew the sleds have evolved, but I didn't realize you guys are actually dealing with a lot more weight than than they are now. Oh, and different. Oh, sleds were totally different, and you had to adapt your driving style to what kind of sled you were pulling. Yeah, that's fascinating. 
Your dad is, uh, or your dad was a World War II veteran. Where he was in the Navy, correct? And can you talk? Pacific, a, he was in the Pacific. He was in the Pacific because I had read yep. different things, and I my understanding is that he had some sort of he saw some sort of action around Okinawa or something like that. Yeah, he was looked. in Okinawa, and then actually after the war, they kept him on for a while, and he ended up uh, on the Yangtze River in China. Really? Yes. Wow. See that yeah, that I did not uh, that I did not know about. That's amazing. And Walter was also both guys. Both of the guys served in World War II. My understanding. No, Walter was out for the war. Walter was in the Navy, but he was out by the time of the war. And of course, he was far older, so that makes sense. Right. And you know, if you had any sort of, uh, oh, I guess you're a kid at school. You're ten years old. You walk in, and your dad has, you know, just gone 576 miles an hour. Do any of the kids at school know what's going on? Was it was it something that was making? And I'm sure I'm sure it made a lot of local headlines. But in terms of your day to day life as a kid, how did it affect you with your buddies? Well, it's funny because we had moved into a new neighborhood, and everybody's dad that lived in the neighborhood worked for Goodyear. Oh no way! <laughs> oh yeah, way. <laughs> Oh, that's something else. So there was a lot of grimacing, I'm sure. Whenever he would set the record, there was not a lot of balloons tied to the front steps of the house, I'm guessing. No, it was a little different. (laughs) Man, that's something else. When he would test this car or when he would take the thing and and put it on Sponson's, I mean, how involved were you in any of that? Were you allowed to go? Were you sitting in the truck? Were you, you know, would he have the thing chained up to trees? I mean, how often does stuff like that happen in terms of actually testing this thing on, you know, in Akron on Pickle Road? Well, the boat, the, you know, the car was all, it was a known, uh, didn't have to test the engine or anything because it was, it was something we knew it could work. But, you know, it was the car. It was just a matter of putting it in the water. And I was there for the first one, but when they take it out the second time, I was in school. Gotcha. Yeah, it's uh... But, no, it, it, that was one of the few cars we had to test much. I mean, a lot, you know, when we built Super Cyclops and like the Dud, there was a ton of test work down there for those. Well, the dud is so interesting because that was, you know, design-wise, a complete departure than what he had done before. And was was the design there an, an idea or a, a plan to kind of maintain a modern look? Because obviously, if you've got an exhibition-style car, you needed to you needed to have some visual pop. No, so. that's there's a whole the, see the dud. It earned its name <laughs> when he when he held the dad never ever wanted to be exhibition. He always wanted to run in competition. The only reason he had. You know, they kicked the Allisons out, so he went to the jet car. But that was only because they wouldn't let him run in competition with the Allisons anymore. So he wanted to get back in the top fuel. The, the Dud was built with an Allison T40 uh, turbine engine. It was 4,000 horsepower. The Dud was wheel drive when he built it. Oh, yeah. And it had, it looked just like it does. Uh, the, when it ended up with the J34, it's about the same size engine, but the J34 is a thrust engine. The T40 was a shaft drive. a shaft engine. drive, yeah. And it had a chain drive going back to the rear wheels. The differential was in the intake right behind the driver's head. And then that fed out to two chain drives that went back. And he either would lose a clutch or he kept losing chains. He just couldn't get it to stay together. I never knew that. I never knew it was uh, it was wheel driven to start with. I had only I'd oh, seen. Oh yeah, we this, got a picture yeah. of it at the airport, smoking the tires going down the track. <laughs> one of the, and I mean, it's got you can tell the front's about lifting. I, I mean, if he could have made it work, four thousand horse back then, it, it would have been unbelievable. Oh, it would have been. And you know, because re- AHRA and IHRA would allow turbines to run. Yeah, back beca- in the day. well, because you drove the ninth the front engine car, the the uh, right. was it Green right. Monster nineteen, right? And I yep. was gonna I was gonna get into that next. And obviously, you did a an amazing job bringing that car back and the video that exists um from from when you were running it a couple of years ago is spectacular but yeah if you can if you can go down that road a little bit with the front engine the front engine shaft driven car because my understanding is you actually did qualify that thing at top fuel a couple in top fuel at a couple shows uh ted did a couple shows and i did a couple shows also and but we were still i mean it was still you know we were bottom of the list you know first round loser but it yes it got in and the experience of driving that car was what? Because visually, it just looks insane. It's you know what everybody thinks that, but the car wasn't that. It's like driving a rear engine car. Okay. Unless you got the fire going and everything, it's it's a little bit like looking over a highway, you know, on a hot day. Okay. Yeah, the waves, like the heat waves. It's wavy, but you can see everything. Man. Now, on the first one, the exhaust sat up a little bit higher. Uh, I mean, you almost was looking over the exhaust, but um, the car I built was, it was real low. You could, I mean, you could look, actually, when I was staging and I had the turbine wheel locked, 
you could see the turbine wheel glowing when it was taped. <laughs> It was cool because you're looking right at the wheel. Oh man, yeah, and and as far as the power goes, I mean, I guess it's it would it be more linear than a, than a regular piston engine in terms of how that thing actually makes its power. Oh, uh, the it, the torque is what what helps because okay. you don't need a transmission. It it almost works like a, a torque converter. Okay. I never gave it enough time to. The car would have went in the sixes. The quick, quickest I ever went was seven twenty two. Okay. And I was still learning to drive it, but. I, I came up with a health issue and I got out of it for a while. And I, I think if they would have let me drive it with a t-shirt, I would have kept driving it. But at my age and having issues sitting at, within the dash 20 fire suit in the middle of an afternoon when it's 80 degrees, you die in that thing. Yeah. It's not, it's not a good recipe. If, um, if you have one, uh, if you have, you know, a favorite childhood story, if you have a favorite, you know, childhood memory of your dad, uh, are there any that jump out at you to the kind of the, the front of your mind? Oh God, I you know I had to it, it had to be in tractor pulling though when he won the Indy, uh, the Indy Super Bowl after he'd been so close so many times and he couldn't just get it the one time he won it yeah, it was special I think that would have been my favorite. And how old were you at that point? Well, that's when I was in my late twenties, cool. early thirties back then. Now that's neat. Yeah, he's uh. He's a fascinating guy, and um, it's neat. Uh, you know, I talked to Samuel Hawley, who wrote the the Speed Duel book, and being able to speak to you, and it's it's really cool to kind of introduce your dad to an audience. I think people know your dad's name, but to actually get uh, some of this information from you guys is is really cool to to give people a really accurate picture about uh, the guy that he was, and not just somebody who accomplished some great things, but he was a, a pretty great guy as well. So, well, you know, and it's amazing no one's ever done a movie because I mean, I'm telling you, this, when you look at back at what he did, it was. I mean, he did a. He was pickers. He was junkyard wars. He was all that <laughs> shit rolled into one. I mean, he, the essence right. of hot rodding is dealing with the stuff you have in front of you, with whatever money you have to spend, and then going out there trying to make it as fast and as great as it is. And that's exactly what your dad did. And I'll tell you what was the other great thing about my. It was more. I knew him in drag racing, but more in the tractor pulling was going junking to the aircraft junkyards with my dad and EJ Potter. That was just unbelievable. We hung out with EJ a lot. We went. We'd always go to the scrap yards with him. Oh, they must you have know, been EJ kids. Tractor pulled too. Kids. Oh, I know EJ was great. The ugly and double ugly tractors. Oh yeah, he was. He was great. But yeah. I tell you what, I, about the cheapest guy you've ever seen. <laughs> We were at a tractor pull in Canada. I was only like 18 years old, and Dad was doing something. So me and EJ went in the town to get lunch. So we're in town, and you know, he paid my bill. EJ is paying his bill, and it was like five dollars. So he hands the girl a twenty, and then she starts to give him change. He goes, "Well, what about the uh, conversion?" And she says, "Well, we don't do that here." He goes, "Well, what do you mean? It's like four percent. I want my change." <laughs> He goes, you'll have to go down to the bank. And he goes, well, okay, I'll go to the bank. you got to pay your bill. You can't. He goes, I'll leave the kid here as a deposit. <laughs> and he left me there. You were collateral. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, those two guys in the junkyard must have been just in hog heaven. Oh, I can't even imagine. Oh, it, it, was, it was great. If there is one central element of the life of Art Arfons that is confusing to learn about and even to read about, it's the feud that he had with his brother, a feud that's been alluded to a couple times earlier in the show, but one that began in the late 50s and very early 60s and lasted for the remainder of their lives. It was really only written about in depth one time, and it's a story written by Jack Olson in Sports Illustrated, published on November 29, 1965. The title of the story, My Brother, My Enemy, in Speedland, and it centers around the fact that these two guys who are vying for this record don't speak anymore, and no one really knows why. And I quote from Jack Olson. Their brothers are Fonz, Walter and Arthur, designers and builders of wild, gleaming machines that flash across the Bonneville salt flats at speeds close to sound, work in adjacent garages on a small junk-strewn plot of land on Pickle Road in Akron, Ohio. But even though they come into shoulder-rubbing proximity daily, even though their sons of one brother are likely to be found clamoring around the latest experimental car of the other, Walter and Art Arfons do not speak. Each professes to be profoundly disturbed by this slate of events, and each insists that it was not he who engineered the events that sundered them, and each seems to be busily widening and deepening the chasm. 
If someone stops his garage and wants to know where my garage is, Arthur says in a typical diatribe against his brother, he don't know where it is, even though it's next door. He don't know what my phone number is or nothing. My brother has a real good personality. He's a real pleasant guy, and he's sharper than anyone gives him credit for, and he knows how to make an ass out of me eight ways to Sunday. Says Walter in the cheek-turning manner that nettles his brother, I like Arthur. I want to be his friend, but I'm even afraid to go over and talk to him now. Being that he'll give me the cold shoulder so many times, I just don't want to be turned down. Hell, if I'm turned down, then I feel really lousy. In front of people, you know, so I don't know what to do. What should I do? Arthur says Walter is a hypocrite. He should come right out and admit his hatred. I think if you're mad at somebody and you're not going to speak to him, Arthur said, why be two-faced about it? The near sonic speeds and the frightful expense of mounting a land speed racing assault have cut the number of aspirants to almost nothing. For those three or four, the rewards and the tensions are correspondingly high, and it's little wonder that the competitors are not friendly. A few years ago, the British land speed challenger Donald Campbell had a chat with Arthur Arfons on the salt flats. I was wearing Steve Petrazic's jacket, with his name sewed on it, Art recalls, and Campbell said, Nice to meet you, Steve. And I thought, why, you son of a bitch? There's only three or four men in the world running for this record, and you don't even know my name? If I meet him again, I'll say, Campbell. Campbell, I think I've heard of you someplace. Wasn't your dad in this business? Walter Arfons is a short, chunky man of 48 with curly graying, plastic hair, plastic rim glasses, and a voice only a few decibels louder than his brother. He's gracious and companionable. He pours drinks, offers cigarettes, and goes out of his way to make people around him feel at home. If there are ten men in a room and the ginger ale runs out, Walter Arfons will be the one to go get it. His most obvious characteristic is his carefulness, not only about himself, but about his money, his family, and his stable of cars and drivers. As Walter speaks about driving, and no longer being able to drive because he's had a heart attack, I continue. So all I can do is sit around and worry about my boys, worry about everybody that's driving. I think the one thing that would hurt me more than anything else in the world would be to build a car that would hurt another man. Does this amorphous fear of other drivers include his brother? Certainly I worry about Arthur. He's been pushed a lot financially. He's got everything he owns invested in that car of his, and he was being pushed so hard he had to do it. I'm the same way this year, but I'm trying not to push so hard because there's another man's life involved, not mine. With Arthur, he's risking his own life every time he drives that car of his. I worry about him plenty. Says Ed Snyder, Arthur's partner and chief mechanic and best friend, don't let him kid you. Walter doesn't give a damn about Art. He doesn't care if Art lives or dies. Arthur feels that Snyder's evaluation is not entirely inaccurate. Whatever is eating the two brothers is not clearly traceable to their roots or their childhood, as they remember them. As young boys, they were barely acquainted. Their mother, Bessie, now 65 and living in retirement in Florida, was married twice, and the boys had different fathers. But Tom Arfons was really the only father either, either of us knew, Walt says. Arthur didn't even know we were half-brothers until he was in high school. Their childhood seems to have been uneventfully pastoral. We never did anything together, Walt says, because I was 10 years older. I took care of him and changed his diapers and all that, and I had to babysit for him. But then when he started to go to school, I went into the Navy, and soon after I got out of the Navy, he went in, so we really didn't get to know each other as buddies until after the war. Arthur speaks of his childhood. The best friend I had was Ed Snyder. He's my partner now. I couldn't have been anywhere without him. He's been a more of a brother to me than any brother I ever had. Ed lived on a farm down the road, and he moved there when I was 10 or 12. I played with him a little, but old Ed had a tough time, and they had, t they had work for him to do. There was no playing in them days either. It was the Depression, and kids had it rough. I've actually wondered what happened to me to make me the way I am today. Why do I do the things I do? I just don't know. I haven't the slightest idea. Says Walter's wife, Gertrude, Arthur's big problem is that he's a bad loser. Lots of people are bad losers, but he is an exceptionally bad loser. From the beginning, Gertrude Arfons and June Arfons, Arthur's wife, had failed to hit it off, and little by little, the whole atmosphere had soured. Soon, there were veiled hints of the wives and the other brothers were being exploited financially, and then we began to argue, Walter says, and all of a sudden we just couldn't seem to get along. Arthur's hard to work with anyway. Things got to be done his way. If I have a good idea and try to work it out, nope, he won't want to do it that way. We have to do it his way. And when you start arguing like that, you just can't work together. The brothers ended their business relationship by splitting up the family mill, which had been left to them by their father, and Walter feels he was even scragged out on that last financial deal of their partnership. I always wanted the piece of land that he has now, and he held the deal up for a year because he would have no other piece but that. It only took a few years for the Arfons brothers, operating individually, to enter the royalty of hot rotting. 
trucking their various green monsters from strip to strip, they flourished in that honky tonk atmosphere of blocked off country roads, amber lighted dragways, dusty abandoned airports in the Midwest, and baking 105 degree heat. Walter expanded and kept several different green monsters running at once, watching his nickels and dimes carefully and became financially solid even as his heart trouble was retiring him as a driver. Arthur remained what he has always been, what a close fa family friend affectionately called a one-man circus. He refuses to allow anyone else to drive his cars. If somebody got hurt in my car, it'd probably ruin my life, Arthur says, sounding like Walter, even more so. When a few years ago it became obvious that Walter and Art Arfons, along with one or two others, had become the best hopes to return the land speed record to the U.S., the brothers found themselves signed up to commercial sponsorships. Walter with Goodyear and Arthur with Firestone, thus ending any easy route to a reconciliation. As standard bearers for the two biggest rubber companies in the world with gross national sales and annual sales in the billions, brothers became the cutting edges for forces vastly more powerful than themselves. A few days later, it was all forgotten in the excitement of a new land speed record. Tom Green of Wheaton, Illinois, in a jet car designed and built by Walt Arfons and sponsored by Goodyear, roared to a two-way average of 413 miles an hour over the measured mile at Bonneville, breaking Donald Campbell's record of 403.1 and Breedlove's three-wheel mark of 407.45. When the record time was announced and Green sat in the cockpit, tears streaming down his face, Walter Arfons maintained his self-control except for a little hooping and hollering, until he sighted the figure of his brother hurrying out of the crowd toward him. Arthur held out his hand, and the two feuding brothers embraced. I damn near had tears in my eyes, Arthur recalls. And that night he phoned his mother in Florida and told her, Mom, I made up with Walter. We're buddies again. Everything's fine. Wasn't. We'll talk more about that in a while, but an interesting window by Jack Olson into the feud of the Arfons brothers. But now we have to turn to another feud, and that is the feud that Art Arfons ends up engaging with Craig Breedlove. The ultimate feud of land speed racing history, the ultimate battle between two guys, one a very flashy, a very well-trained, a very polished California hot rodder, and the other, Art Arfons from the Midwest working in his dingy shop with old junk parts. It is an amazing story of two different personalities both chasing the same goal, and it is the subject of a book called Speed Duel, written by Samuel Hawley. And Samuel Hawley joins us now as our next guest to tell the story of Craig Breedlove and Art Arfons as he can best. Before we talk to Sam, this is some great audio from a film called Challenge that was made by Firestone when Arfons reset the record in 1965 to 536 miles an hour. It's a great lead-in to the attitude and a great lead-in to Samuel Hawley here because it really kind of sets the tone as to what this guy was trying to do, who he was trying to do it with, and how hard he was trying to do it with very little budget. Listen to this clip from Challenge, and then we'll hear from Samuel Hawley. Today, she will run. Today, the girl from the other side of the tracks will try to become a lady, to prove to the men who love her that money isn't everything. The record-breaking cars before her were built by experts and cost a fortune. Donald Campbell's $3 million Bluebird had 70 companies behind it, and the support of all England. Craig Breedlove's Spirit of America represented a quarter of a million dollars. The Green Monster, $10,000 total. It's absolutely impossible to build a 500 mile an hour car for $10,000. But our funds didn't know that. So he built her anyway. He built her with his head, his heart, and his hands instead of money. I welcome Samuel Hawley onto the show, and uh, Sam is an author who has written, uh, I, I would actually say crafted, probably one of the, my favorite books that I've ever read, and that book is Speed Duel, which tells the incredible story of Craig Breedlove and Art Arfon's battle for the land speed record during the middle 1960s. So Sam, welcome to the show. Well, thanks. So your book is so fascinating to me because it paints a very interesting, I think, an in-depth picture of both of the men involved in that battle, and um, we're going to concentrate on Art Arfons here today. And, you know, Mickey Thompson gets a lot of credit, and people call him kind of the greatest hot rodder that ever lived. 
with good reason. But in my mind, I think that title ends up should be on Arfon's shoulder because this is a guy who really did it on his own and did it with very little budget as compared to guys like Bree Love and like uh, Mickey Thompson. He was really completely building his own stuff out of that little shed on Pickle Road. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Craig Craig Breedlove's story is great too. That the the quintessential hot rodder, but his approach was different. I mean, he he started out with his buddies, but uh, he was convinced that he needed like major sponsorship. He needed to get together a big team in order to make it happen. Art Arfons never went that route. It was Art Arfons, his friend Ed Snyder, and a couple of guys working in Art's shop. I mean, that's the way Art did it all the way through his life. And, and I mean, one of he, he got sponsors to get to pay to go out to Bonneville, but in terms of building the car and everything, it was Art Arfons and his inner circle. Yeah, and, and I think the, one of the reasons that uh, that the story has such great depth is because you have, you know, Craig Breedlove is is the personification of what cool was in the 1960s, right? He's a guy from California. He's good looking. He's got a great smile. He's flashy. He understands how to work the media. And then you have Art Arfons, who is the, the quintessential guy from the middle of Ohio. He's from the Rust Belt, and he's kind of quiet and introspective. And I guess I'd like to speak to that a little bit. How did Arfons actually view Breedlove? Well, I, I mean, they, they were rivals, certainly, back in the 60s. But, you know, at, at the same time, they were friends. Um, when, when, Breed, when Breedlove was, you know, both, both of them were sponsored by the Tire Guys. Yes. Uh, Goodyear for Breedlove and Firestone for uh, Art Arfons. Both of them in Akron, Ohio. So when Breedlove was visiting Goodyear, he'd he'd sometimes go and drop by Art Arfon's shop and and check you know chat with Art Arfon. So they weren't bitter enemies by any stretch of the imagination. But I mean, there were times when yeah, they they, they you know there there was tension in the, in the '60s, like when um when when uh, Craig Breedlove like rebuilt his Spirit of America, he kept quiet about it and kind of lulled Art Arfons into thinking that he wasn't going to be back in the game until, you know, 1966. And then, and, uh, that, and then Breedlove shows up in 65. That kind of annoyed Art somewhat. But uh, a lot of guys would, get, would go into the, the, the land speed thing back then, thinking that if they, if they broke the land speed record, it would be a way to get rich, rich and famous. And, you know, I mean, Craig Breedlove did really well, but with him it was a roller coaster ride. He made money, he lost it. He made it, he lost it. <laughs> Art Arfons, this quiet guy, this farmer type of guy, he just kind of quietly prospered through all of these years. You know, by doing it his own quiet way, he, he did very well for himself and his family uh, with, the, with the hot rods, with the land speed record. You know, he didn't... He didn't uh, build up these gigantic dreams, and then everything comes crashing <laughs> down. He just quietly did really well for himself. So you got to really admire the guy for that. No, absolutely. And and as as maybe I don't want to say simple, but as on the surface of things, as simple as we can look at a guy like Art Arfons, the you know salt of the earth Ohioan who's out there with his own two hands and his buddies you know, strapping uh, a J79 engine to a pair of trees and running it behind his shop to figure out how it all works. There was a deeper side to this guy. And, you know, he had the the long running, I don't want to say a cold war, but it was kind of a long running feud that developed for reasons that no one has really ever talked about between his, him and his half brother, Walt, who, you know, both of those guys were instrumental in getting their careers going. And ultimately they ended up going in slightly different directions. But, you know, to me, uh, that's an interesting part of the depth of Art Arfons and the fact that it wasn't just as simple as the guy from Ohio running for the land speed record. There was a very deep-seated competitive nature to this man that, that may not have been as obvious as it was out of Craig Breedlove, but it certainly existed. Yeah, absolutely. That That is such an interesting aspect of the Art Arfons story was this was this feud. I mean, I, I won't say rivalry. It was an out-and-out out feud between Art and his half-brother, Walt Arfons. I mean, they had shops literally right beside <laughs> each other, and they never communicated. Uh, so really interesting. I think that, I think that, that I mean, there, there was no one incident that right. resulted in these two brothers um, falling out with each other. Because back in the 50s, they were, they were very close. They were friends. They, they got along well together. But... When they started making money, going to the drag strips with their green monster, um, with their green monster uh, dragsters, um, they, they would uh, they would take two cars so that they could both run a car and have a better chance at making uh, the, the prize money. Sure. 
And art arthons was very competitive when when they would do this. So and this this started to rile Walt. Like if one of them got top uh, top time, they they would split the money. I mean that's how it went. It was a business. They'd split the money. But so if but if uh, if Walt would get top time and they got the money earned. Art would then go out and try to beat it. He'd try to beat his own brother. And that that kind of competitiveness started to come between them. And I think from that point on, it just the rift got more and more and more until it was a complete break in the relationship. Yeah, and, and again, from your book and other reading I've done, there were these little kind of moments that, that the humanity or the, the, the brotherly, half-brotherly relationship would come through. Um, and one of them that you tell so poignantly in the book is one where Walt is out there with the, uh, with the Wingfoot car and they're trying to go fast and they have the salt and, and it's art that basically tells him to open the, open the blades up or open the, the tail of the jet up a little bit on the back of his car and it will go faster. And of course it does. And then what, just a handful of days later, art shows up and just blows that number right out of the water. It's almost like Walt's, you know, record didn't exist. So you know, and then obviously after Art has his uh, his crash at at Lord only knows six hundred some miles an hour, uh, he is visited by Walt in the hospital again from your book Speed Duel. So there were those moments where you know it, it would happen, and you know it it's just a it's it's interesting and it's a little bit sad, obviously, because you never want to see family members have that type of a rift. But to go back to the story of the opening the 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 tail of the jet up a little bit to to make more speed, do you think Art? Pass that advice on, full well knowing that he was going to go faster than anything Walt was going to do anyway, so it didn't really matter. Or was that a genuine attempt to to help his brother? Um, I, I it's hard to say. It's sure. hard to say. I, I think uh, uh, Walt. Uh, I think Art knew he could go faster. I mean, at that time, um, the Wingfoot Express, uh, Walt and uh, Art Arfons and Tom Green, they, they were just kind of it, it, they were on the verge of just tweaking past Craig Breedlove's record, whereas Art showed up with his J-79 Green Monster, and he was he, kind of, he was probably confident that he was going to just blast past that record. So, yeah. I mean, you could, maybe he was throwing his brother a bone. Uh, I, I think he honestly wanted to help out another hot rodder. I mean, there's, yeah. there is this other aspect of this whole thing that's just that goes beyond that kind of family tension. There's this brotherhood amongst um, hot rodders. Yes. You know, here's Art. He, he's looking on. He's seeing a fellow hot rodder. They're struggling, and he kind of sees a problem, so he's going to offer the help. I mean, he was he was a decent guy, so he wasn't going to withhold information that he had. Yeah, no, and it so, makes. I mean, thanks to him giving them that little tip, he gave it to he gave it to Tom Green, and then Tom Green passed it on to Walt. They tweaked the the, the settings, and they they uh, broke the record. Yeah, and it, and. Obviously, it was a very short term or a very short time that they held that record, but um, what it would have done for Walt in terms of, you know, the car was the Wingfoot Express, obviously, because of a partnership with Goodyear. So that was something that I'm sure Walt was able to extend his his uh, land speed racing career with and make a couple of bucks. Even if it was just a short time, they did set the record. So, yeah, there was definitely, as you said, there was more to it than just uh, than just that. There was also kind of benefiting the cause. Um how you know when you were putting the book together, and of course the overriding story to me of the land speed record in the '60s is, as it is for everybody, it's the English have dominated this kind of this kind of style of motorsport for years. The it, the the land speed record was a bit of I mean a British pride. It is again today in 2020, but it was for so many years until the hot rodders kind of came up and started wrestling them for it and ultimately took it away for so many decades. Um, how, how much pride did those hot rodders take in that, in the fact that they were kind of battling no, the nobility of England in order to get this record back? Oh, I, I think they took a huge pride in it. Um, in fact, I, I think sometimes they, they kind of um, inflated the whole thing about the English <laughs> nobility. I mean, some of those these English land speed guys, they, they weren't <laughs> dukes and lords and stuff. But, I mean, the hot rod guys in the States, I think they like to play that up a bit. I mean, talking with um, uh, Mickey Thompson's guy, what's his name? I can't remember, the, like, really earthy guy. And uh, he, he, re- he really played that up. When him and, and Mickey Thompson were out on, out on the salt flats, and uh, George Easton was there. Oh, sure. Looking down his nose at them as they were kind of struggling with the transmission on the back of their pickup truck. I think, I think some of those hot rodder guys loved that aspect of it, that we were rubbing our noses in these highfalutin uh, English guys. <laughs> 
It's great. And, and, and hey, listen, if if for nothing else, it makes for a fun way to tell the story, right? And everybody, yeah, <laughs> everybody loves a good story. Uh, what 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 are the things for you, someone who studied this man and studies his, studied his accomplishments? What are the things that stand out most to you about Art Arafans? Um, the, the 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 toughness of this guy. I mean, he 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 made it look kind of easy. When I mean, what he was doing was so profoundly hard. Like the first time that he took the Green Monster out to Bonneville in 1964, you know, it, it, this, you know, the, the, they didn't write about this much. It was only from the research I did. But he almost gave up. I mean, that wow. car was so uncomfortable to drive. Like the way he um, Art was crammed in that cockpit, he could hardly see. I mean, his field of vision was just cut off by the side of the vehicle. And when he would get going, it would kind of bound up and down. It was just, it was so profoundly uncomfortable and dangerous feeling to drive that thing that he almost gave up. But, it, I mean, just because of the kind of guy he was, he gritted his teeth and he just went out the next day and he just basically pedaled to the metal and he broke through. And uh, just the toughness of this guy is what amazes me. And, in fact, when he, when he tried to return to Bonneville in the late 1980s at the age of of uh, 60 something um he was going to do it one more time and he 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 kind of was shocked to realize that that toughness was gone i mean that was a big that, um, i kind of write about that at the end of speed duel um he, he just his body he just didn't have it anymore he didn't have that young guy's body and that young guy's steely mind and determination and he had to give it up at that point but that, that's something i just love about art Arfons was just how the guy was made of steel. Yeah, and that's and that's a great way to put it. And again, I, I direct people to your YouTube page um, to watch one of the videos and watch them all because they're fantastic. But uh, the one that you had posted regarding the tire failures that he kept having as the car is exceeding 500 plus miles an hour, the right rear tire keeps failing, and this doesn't stop him. It annoys him that they have to keep fixing the car. But yet again, he gets in the thing and off he goes down the salt. And it's just um, it, it it takes. It, and it's interesting because who knows what you know? You can never really get inside somebody's mind. And it, to me, it's always fascinating when we when we look at people's motivations for doing what they do. When we look at great athletes, what are they motivated by? Did they come from some sort of a, a a really rough background that they've been trying to escape and kind of defeat for their whole lives? Like you know, what was it? And and I'm not asking you to answer this because I don't think anybody knows. But what was it that made that guy the 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 tough the tough guy that he was? Because he didn't. He wasn't somebody that publicly reveled in the danger, right? He didn't stand up there and say he was never a guy that promoted the danger of what he was doing, I guess, in, in my mind. Or am I wrong about that? No, you're absolutely right about that. But, you know, every time he set the record, he blew out his right rear tire. I mean, it, it was obviously unexpected the first time it happened. But the second time it happened and the third time it happened, Art Arfons knew that was coming. He Because that, that J79 jet engine of his... Uh, it, it, they'd hot routed that thing, like taking out damaged blades and stuff, and kind of it was just a rough and ready fix that they did. But the, as a result of that, it put out so much torque that it put a lot of pressure down on the right rear end of the car, and it was too much for those Firestone tires. So um, when Art would get going, that tire would blow out. I mean, just imagine going out on the highway. You know, you're going to go 60 miles an hour, and you know that your, your tire is going to blow. You know, sometimes when I'm driving uh, home to, to visit uh, mom and dad, my tire is going to blow. I know it. And going and doing it anyway. But that's what Art Arfons was doing. But he, he wasn't going 60 miles an hour. He was going 500 <laughs> miles an hour. And he did it anyway. I mean, it, it's mind-boggling how, how uh, tough this guy was. Yeah, it, uh, again, just in my mind, just a fascinating man, someone that you capture so well in the book. And again, I can't say it enough. It is I pride myself on being a guy that likes to read and and read a lot on on a lot of different subjects, especially in motorsports. And um, every single person I have told to read Speed Duel has said that once they get through the first three or four pages, it's it. They cannot stop with the book. And I guess to your to to ask you a couple questions on that front, how long did you, or how long was the research period to put that together? And obviously, you continue to release new material uh, via YouTube and and your other uh, your other social media means. So, how much stuff do you have left that obviously you can't fit in a book that we're going to get to revel in here as time goes on? <laughs> uh, well, uh, with regard to speed duel, that took a little over a year. 
uh, to do. In fact, I came up with the idea. I just kind of had the the thought of the land speed record. You know, it just kind of occurred to me as a as a possibility for a book, and uh, I just checked on the internet, and within uh, 30 minutes of of just kind of doing some general research on Wikipedia, whatever, I, I stumble on the the. Um, Craig Breedlove versus Art Arfons thing. Okay. And, and I had it was in the back of my mind. I hadn't thought about it in years and years. And I, I, I just a quick look around and I realized nobody's ever written a book about this thing. Yeah. So th- that was like the most serendipitous book I, idea I ever had. It is. Uh, it's fantastic. And and uh, again, can't say enough about it. It's, it's enthralling. And I think it's the most poignant moment in that book is the conversation between Breedlove and Arfons when they're, you know, in the height of this thing and it's the record's going back and forth. And I think it was Breedlove that uh, that Breedlove asked Arfons, you know, do we just keep going until someone gets killed here? Or, or like, what do we do? You know, and I think that, that summed it all up to me where it was like, these guys, these two kind of men of steel did have a moment where both of them looked each other in the eye and thought, maybe this isn't the smartest idea in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that that's such a... It, it, it seems like like such a Hollywood movie kind of scene where Craig Breedlove is is walking, you know, uh, in the evening at uh, Wendover, and uh, Art Arfons kind of comes out of the darkness, and they have this chat, and uh, Art Art says, "So, like, wh- where's this going to end? I mean, you you take the record from me, and I take it back from you, and we keep going until one of us gets killed." I mean, that's what he said. It sounds like a Hollywood writer wrote that. But both Breedlove and Arfons confirmed that scene, and that's basically how it happened uh, on the side of the road in Wendover in the evening. And so it's an absolutely true story. So now we need to continue the story after that great conversation with Samuel Hawley. We need to do it on two fronts simultaneously. The first front is Arfon's achieving his ultimate success and his ultimate speed on the Bonneville Salt Flats of over 576 miles an hour. And the second front is a feud that we believed after the last Jack Olson story in the 1965 issue of Sports Illustrated had come to an end with his brother Walt, as we'll learn quickly in a story that was published the very next issue of Sports Illustrated, the feud definitely did not end. December 6, 1965, Duel on the Salt is the title of the story written by Jack Olson. Bonneville is sort of an eerie place, as Art Arfons, one of the two feuding brothers who come annually to the Salt Flats to tilt at the world's land speed record. You feel all alone when you're on the salt. You look down that emptiness and it's just eerie as hell. It makes me uneasy. Within the close-knit club of Bonneville racers, there was happiness last year when Walt and Arthur Arfons met in tearful embrace after Walter's Wingfoot Express, sponsored by Goodyear, set a new land speed record at 413.2 miles an hour. For long years, the brothers had feuded, speaking rarely, then only when it was absolutely unavoidable, and their personal antagonism had been a sour note in an otherwise friendly and fraternal sport. But now that the feud was ended, Walter happily trucked his record-breaking Wingfoot Express toward Akron, and Arthur readied his own green monster for an attack on his brother's record. Nobody took Arthur too seriously. He'd been hacking around the salt flats for several years, and his homemade green monster had never really even hit 400 miles an hour. But three days after Walter's record, Arthur drove his jet-powered car 434.02 miles an hour on two runs across the measured mile at Bonneville, riding out a blown tire in the process and taking the world land speed record away from Brother Walter. Arthur was carried off by member of, members of his crew, several of whom were crying unashamedly. Walt Arfons was driving his truck through the mountains of Wyoming when he heard the news that Art had broken his record. He rushed to a phone, quoting Walt. I was just as glad for him as he'd been for us, Walter remembers. I'd have felt hurt if someone else had set the record besides him and I, so I called him and I congratulated him. My whole crew congratulated him. He was so pleased with the call that he called our mother in Florida and told her, told her about me calling him. But as Plutarch observed in Moralia, on brotherly love, when brothers have once broken the bonds of nature, they can come together again only with difficulty, and even if they do, their reconciliation bears it with a filthy hidden sore of suspicion. Says Arthur Arfons, after we'd made up and all, he just turned right around and did me some real dirty tricks right after we left Bonneville, and I thought, well, I've made up with you for the last time. I'll tell you one little dirty thing he had done. 
I'd been buying fill dirt to build up a low spot in my garage, but when I came home from the salt, I discovered he'd been having a basement dug for his new house, and it had dumped about 50 loads of dirt across the street from me. And I would have paid him. Paid him for the dirt and the hauling. Yet he hates me that much that he would take and haul it over to a neighbor. And I tell you, it's something small, but it's the principle of the thing. And it just burnt me to no end. Walter's explanation is simple. I didn't even know he wanted dirt. Within a few days of his return to Akron, Arthur's attention was diverted back to the salt flats. Craig Breedlove, a 27-year-old California hot rodder sponsored by Goodyear and Shell, had driven his three-wheeled Spirit of America through the clocks at 468.72 miles an hour to break Art's record. Then the gritty Breedlove, who drives in boxer-style athletic shoes and an oxygen mask and runs his operation like a Cecil B. DeMille production, upped his own record to 526 wrecking his racer but becoming the first person to ever be timed over 500 in a wheeled vehicle on land. Back to the salt came Art Arfons and his crazy, mixed-up, red-nosed green monster, described by some as the ugliest land speed car in the world, for one last crack before the snow set in. On the second of his two speed runs the next day, Art Arfons blew a tire again, this time at a speed estimated at 600-plus miles per hour. Explain Humpy Wheeler of the sponsoring Firestone team, the Green Monster's engine has tr tremendous torque, and when Art cuts into the afterburner, it throws more than half the weight of the car in the right rear tire. There isn't a tire made on Earth that can stand up to a load at 600 miles an hour, and to make things worse, he hasn't got any suspension back there to cushion it. But blowouts don't bother Art. He knew exactly what to do because for the last 10 years, this guy's been running up and down drag strips faster than anybody and accelerating to more total G-forces than anybody else, so he didn't panic. He hit the kill button on the steering wheel, this shut down the engine, and he coasted to about 500 miles an hour, then he popped his first chute. That went all to pieces, and jerked the car real bad. He just held onto the steering wheel until he straightened the car out, then popped the other chute at 400 miles an hour, and it tore in two, but it slowed him down, and at 350 he turned, he used the brakes, burned them out, and then just rode the car down to a stop on three wheels. While Arfons and his crew members were standing around mourning the damage to the green monster, a timer announced that the car had averaged 536.71 miles an hour for another new land speed record, the fifth within a month. With the first storm clouds of winter already marching across the western skies, Walter Arfons hurried back to the salt from Akron in his jet-powered Wingfoot Express, now augmented by three jet-assisted takeoff rockets to regain the record for Goodyear. But heavy rain shut him down, and he returned to the little shop on Pickle Road in Akron to build a whole new car for the 1965 attempts. Speaking of Arfons, a Goodyear executive said, he's strictly a backyard operation. You should see him. They'll take some big piece of metal and put it around a tree with Art on one end and somebody else on the other and bend it into shape. Says Firestone's Wheeler, he even tests the jet engine in the backyard. You can't conceive of it until you've seen it. At first, he'd strap it to two big trees. He burned out a 60-foot channel in his woods that way. He blew a chicken coop right off the face of the earth. He's the coolest guy I've ever seen in my life, and when he's got that engine going on the afterburner in his backyard and I'm 50 feet away, I'm scared to death that it's going to blow to pieces. They do sometimes, you know, and he's right alongside it making adjustments. Early in 1965, Arthur Arfons returned to the salt. His brother was there with a rocket-powered Wingfoot Express. Arthur did nothing on the salt flats except to set a new standing quarter-mile record of 258.62 miles an hour, a Mickey Mouse accomplishment, but one which helped to while away a week in which he figured there was no point in risking his life to break his own land speed record when Walter's rocket car had already failed. Now that Walter had failed, at least for 1965, everyone breathed easier, including Arthur Arfon's best friend and chief mechanic Ed Snyder, who had said earlier, if anybody breaks Art's record, especially if Walt breaks it, Art will come back here and break it right back, or he'll take his car home in pieces. And reporters also remembered the words of Walter Arfon several weeks before. If I didn't make the record, I'd be glad because Arthur wouldn't have to push it no more. I want to break the record. This is my life. This is what I chose. This is the only thing I know. But if I don't make the record, deep down I'm glad I didn't have to push Arthur. I'm afraid for him. He'd throw all precaution to the wind. I wouldn't want nothing bad to happen to him. Then the Green Monster was towed to the south end of the course for a quote-unquote warm-up run. It ain't going to be no warm-up run, a member of the Arfons team confided. You know how Arthur goes, quick and dirty. He'll run up and down that black line all day till he's got the record back or kill himself. Sitting in the cockpit, Arthur appeared relaxed as always, but even quieter than usual as he checked over the instruments. 
plugs in his ears and heavy plastic helmet inhibited any last-minute exchanges as the canopy was dropped into place. And what do they say at this dramatic moment in land speed racing, when the lid is popped down and everyone knows that they may never see the driver again? What is the LSR equivalent to gentlemen start your engines or play ball? Arthur just says okay. Everybody runs like hell and whoosh. The green monster is off, quick and dirty, and out of sight within seconds. I'm interrupting here to tell you at this point, Art Arfons is now trying to chase Craig Breedlove down again. Arfons got the record back. Breedlove came to the salt, knocked him back into second place. Now he's back out there trying to do it. Arthur hit the first timing clock, showing 600 miles per hour in his airspeed indicator. And when he realized he was traveling so fast, he killed the engine and decelerated to an airspeed of 550 before breaking the electric eye on the second clock, marking the end of the measured mile. His official average speed for the first leg turned out to be 575.72 miles an hour, more than enough to regain the record if he could repeat the performance on the return run. The car wandered a little bit, Arthur said, but I let her wander. It had also tended to become airborne, but the automatic hydraulic wing slapped to her back straight down the salt, pushed the front end down with a thump that I could feel in the cockpit, he said. Eight minutes before the end of the hour allotted by timing officials for a legal return run, Arthur gunned the green monster into the measured mile. He had hardly cleared the second clock at the end of the mile when the right rear tire, the same one that had failed in two previous record attempts, went off like a bomb. It's 250 pounds of pressure blowing up the tire and the aluminum wheel and one fat blob of flame that could be seen four miles away. Now for the third time in two seasons, Art Arfons had to fight a blowout at speeds in the five to 600 mile an hour range. He remembered later, I felt a blowout more than I heard it. It was like a big concussion. The car dropped in the right rear corner and the cockpit filled with smoke. I was blinded. I couldn't see the course. I popped open the canopy and the wind sucked the smoke right out. The canopy slammed back and forth about four times like a barn door. And then it broke into pieces. I could see I was off course and I almost lost it. She just about got too far to correct and I was heading for the dike alongside the salt canal where Breedlove crashed last year. By that time I got her under control and I found out that I had no regular chute. When the tire exploded, it wrecked the chute, so I popped the emergency chute, and it held for a while after, until I stopped. No, I wasn't scared. I don't get scared. Arthur explained later, it was a little piece of pipe that I thought had gone right through the engine and ruined it. That's what I was so upset about. Now that the crowd had quieted when Chief Timer Joe Petrelli approached the gathering after the run. Whatever the time, whatever the time Arthur and the Green Monster were through for the year, and everybody knew it. Five seven seven point six three five seven seven point three six eight. Petrelli said simply, and a cheer went up from the crowd as Arthur, smiling shyly, was lifted onto the shoulders of his crew members once more. This was Art Arfon's greatest achievement on the Bonneville Salt Flats, an average of five hundred and seventy six miles an hour. It was a record that almost nobody thought he was able or capable of setting, and he did it while blowing the tires off his car at over 500 miles an hour. I continue with the Jack Olson story. A week later, while television commercials there were trumpeting that Art Arfons had staked his life on Firestones, Craig Breedlove defied the weather and the probabilities and quietly returned to the Salt Flats for another absolute final attempt of the year to break the land speed record. On the first day of his week, it rained. On the second, Breedlove sped to 600.6 miles per hour over the moist salt and took the record for the fifth time. The weather closed in almost at once. Chief Timer Petrelli ordered USAC officials to take the timing equipment off the salt for the season, and the captains and the kings departed. We've got the record for the year, said the cocky young, young Breedlove. Now let's see if ex-King Arthur comes back. Arthur said it would take several months to repair his car and much longer to build a new one. He reckoned he would spend the winter months in his shop on Pickle Road in Akron, and when the snow and ice disappeared from western Utah, perhaps in the late spring, he would be back to run again. I don't know, said a Firestone's humpy wheeler. They're going so fast now, something's bound to happen to somebody. Arthur said maybe that was so, but one old lion was not yet ready to turn and walk away. Humpy Wheeler's name has come into this conversation a couple of times now, and Wheeler is a legend in American motorsport. He is a guy that ran Firestone's racing program during this period of time, not just the land speed program, but every single aspect of Firestone's racing involvement, which was extensive in the 1960s. From drag racing to the Indy 500 to sports car racing, stock car racing, and land speed racing, Humpy Wheeler had his hands on all of it. He would go on to become one of the most celebrated 
personalities, one of the most celebrated businessmen in NASCAR history, operating the Charlotte Motor Speedway through the golden age of NASCAR and well into the modern age as well. Humpy Wheeler, I am happy to say, granted us time on this show for an interview regarding Art Arfons, and Mr. Wheeler, at just a tick over 80 years of age, is still tack sharp, and I feel as though you will enjoy every second of this conversation with Humpy Wheeler in regards to his time with Art Arfons. All right, I am joined by Humpy Wheeler, a man whose uh, reputation, whose history in motorsports really needs no introduction, but for the purposes of this story, we're going to talk about his time spent at Firestone as the director of their racing program and the relationship he had with Art Arfon. So first off, Mr. Wheeler, thank you so much for being part of the show today. Well, delighted to be back up in Massachusetts one way or the other. My father was from Rhode Island, so I'm half New England. Well, that's good, and that's probably where you, you know I know you're a very successful boxer. That's probably where the toughness came from because we're a tough we're a tough breed up here. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't brought uh, uh, brought up in Brockton like Rocky Marciano, but uh, you got some tough fighters up there, and I always enjoyed competing against them. But uh, I'm delighted to be on your show and talk about one of my favorite people, Art Arfon. And if we're going to start with this, uh, we mentioned toughness and. Uh, you respect toughness, you respect bravery. Did you ever meet another man that matched uh, on the scale of tough, toughness or bravery that Art Arfons displayed? None. Um, he had a one-track mind, and that was that long black line at <clears throat> the Bonneville Salt Flats, which, um, you know, the difference between those guys and your regular race drivers, I was... Uh, very involved in the Indy program then. and It was a dangerous time in Indianapolis back sure. in the 60s and uh, a lot of guys getting killed and mayhem. And I, and they, but they were all interested in, in uh, uh, the salt flats and what was going on up there because it got a tremendous amount of publicity. Reader's Digest uh, called it the uh, uh, Russian roulette on the flats. <laughs> and that's exactly <laughs> what it was, yeah. But you know, not one guy at Indianapolis, and I talked to Foyt and Parnelli Jones and Roger Ward and all those brave souls wanted any part of running on the salt flats in those jet cars because um, that was a dangerous pursuit and one that was pretty well going to get you if you did it long enough. And that's the amazing thing to me. Uh, you know, I talked to Samuel Hawley as well for this show, and he wrote the book Speed Duel, which is a fantastic account of of Craig Breedlove and Art Arfons. And they had this, yes. you know, they had this chance meeting out in Wendover, and they both basically looked at each other and said, "What's the end game here?" And the end game really was kind of to go until somebody couldn't go anymore. And unfortunately for Art, that was him. Yeah, it was. Uh... <clears throat> Uh, you you knew from being out there and spending time, uh, and uh, of course I knew uh, Craig Breedlove, but I, of course I knew our fans uh, uh, intimately because uh, we were uh, sponsoring his car. And uh, but those two guys really had the ability to say, "Hey, I'm going down that long line, and I'm going to run those eight or ten miles at full tilt." with thousands of horsepower, knowing that I may not be here when we get back. And just say it matter of fact, uh, that was the astonishing thing about the Salt Flats. Uh, Sir Donald Campbell was the same way. He was from England. Sure. Where the, uh, where they worshipped the land speed record. And um, uh, he had seen all kind of tragedy. When we got out there the first week in 64, a guy named Apple Graham from Salt Lake City. He had a streamliner with two uh, B-29 engines in them. Okay. And um, uh, he ran for two days, and the third day we went out there, and they said, well, he's gone. Well, I'm used to, you know, somebody saying he's gone by meaning he went back home. Yeah. Wrong. He was dead. His car just decided to take off. I don't think they found enough of him to hardly even give him a good burial. Wow. That's how dangerous that place was. Yeah, and and 
you know the 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 layers of the story are amazing obviously the you know the as you mentioned the level of publicity that was generated by these attempts especially for the tire companies was incalculable at the time i mean it was one thing firestone was a dominant brand in racing has been for so many years but to have this particular accolade to have this particular record meant so much to you guys back then how much time are you spending with art away from bonneville for instance when he would set the record which he did three times when he would set a record what was the course of events following that well, we would go on a uh, uh, either a national or a worldwide press tour, depending on how much publicity it got. And so uh, he hated that stuff. He wanted to <laughs> he, he wanted to he wanted to break the the sound barrier, but he didn't want to go talk on TV and talk to Howard Cosell and all those other people in in New York City. He wanted to get back to Akron where he could find another hundred miles an hour somewhere so um but that's just something you did and uh, uh, of course for firestone it was uh uh it, it was the key because uh the company got a tremendous amount of publicity uh out of it but for those guys that ran it i think breed love was a little more uh craig was a little more media conscious than art was art was a half cherokee indian full blood and his father was a, a greek immigrant that had come over here and he looked like a pirate he was yes. dark skin had a sharp nose and uh, a good looking guy though and um, he uh, but a braver man i never knew and I think one of the things that's so interesting about Arfons is he had this he had this kind of high pitch, almost a squeaky voice. And there's a film that was made uh, when he set the record, I think, at 536 miles an hour, called Challenge, that Firestone produced. And yep. it was interesting. Do you, was it a voice actor? I know it wasn't his voice that actually used to voice his lines in the in the film. Was it a decision made because he didn't want to do it, or a decision made because you wanted to have the guy sound like the Incredible Hulk? Because that's what the guy sounds like. <laughs> we want. We, well, all we did is we put some treble in his voice, <laughs> got him, uh, got him a little more deep voice than he was, because <laughs> he was not a big talker. Yeah. And um, he um, he just believed in doing things and getting things done. And you know, I saw him years later after uh, the horrible crash that he had out there, that supposedly ended his career on the salt flats it didn't but it should have um i saw him down in daytona i was down there uh on a trip to uh, see bill france at nascar and there i saw the bus he always had a bus and it had um, art arfons on the side of it and it was a filling station and i had to pull over and dad burn if it wasn't him <laughs> and I, what are you doing here well he had a jet powered tractor and he had gone into pulling. Well, I didn't even know what pulling was. <laughs> but um, he did talk about that quite a bit because he was proud of the records he was setting over in the pulling league. And um, it was the same thing, though. It was it was the little green monster because it wasn't anything like the size of his, his jet car. In terms of, you know, Firestone, this giant corporation, a company that has, you know, at the time, you know, a budget set would just boggle the minds of anybody and you you're working with a guy who would would flinch over spending three dollars on anything what what was there any give and take on that did you you know i know that at least my understanding is you were influential on making sure there was some firestone red on the car when he ran it at bonneville but in terms of going like hey spend five bucks to make this look better i mean was that any of the conversation that you, did you have to convince him to spend money oh yeah because uh he he uh he was used to doing everything on the cheap yeah. Uh, and getting used stuff and rebuilding it and all that kind. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting in my office in Akron one day and I get a call from the FBI uh, wanting to know my association with Mr. Arfons. And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of our guys. And that's, what's, what's the problem? Because, you know, the FBI didn't call you about right. uh, good things. It's usually somebody's in deep, deep, w deep water. And uh, so the guy comes over there and he says, uh, well, he said, we think he got this engine illegally. I, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's a it's a J-79. 
It's got 17,500 horsepower. And the military's never released an engine with that much horsepower. And it's classified. And I said, well, I'm trying to think how in the world they find out about it, number one. Number two, why was he art doing this? And uh, so the bottom line was Art was going to take this giant behemoth engine apart. And he figured, well, he knew a lot about jet engines, but he probably would do him a lot of good if he had an instruction manual. <laughs> so he called uh, General Electric in Ohio, not terribly far from where we were, a couple hundred miles, and asked the guy if he'd send him an instruction manual. <laughs> 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 Jeez. You know. People just don't get instruction manuals for something like that, usually. <laughs> and the guy said, well, that's a, that engine is, uh, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't put out instruction manuals for it. It's a classified engine. Art said, no, it's not classified. I bought it. <laughs> and he had bought it from a guy down in Miami that was a, a surplus dealer who sold to all kind of people. Okay. He sold jet airplanes, he sold helicopters, he sold machine guns, and, and but his specialty was these big jet engines. And um, so I called a guy at uh, GE, and he was kind of laughing about it. He said, what's this guy doing with it? Is he really going to try to break the land speed record? I said, well, uh, let me tell you this right now. He will break it. I don't know if he might break himself, but he's going to break it. And he said, well, we need to take another look at that. So they obviously saw the value of publicity in it. The engine should have been just de uh, declassified at this point anyway, but they just hadn't gotten around to it. So they shuffled a whole bunch of papers around and quickly declassified it, which got the FBI out of the <laughs> Out of there. the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, Art, I called him. I said, Art, I got you an instruction manual. I don't need it now. <laughs> because he waited three weeks, and he'd taken that engine apart with no instruction manual, completely apart, and put it back together in, over in the uh, uh, east part of Akron and uh, in his shop. And so I said, well, I got to come over there. So I came over there. I went over there. And he not only put it back together, but he was he was going to test it. And his version of testing it, and I, let me tell you what GE's version was. Uh, they had this huge concrete pit, which if you filled up with water, would have been a great place to go diving and learn how to do it <laughs> down, down in uh, Cincinnati. And so, I mean, uh, Dayton. And so they uh, they said, well, just tell him to come down here. And he, can tell, he can use our test deal. And I, I was going to tell Art that when I got over there. Uh, lo and behold, Art had that whole car in front of a huge oak tree. He had cable, uh, five-eighths inch cables tied to one side of the engine. And he wrapped it around the other. He pulled around the oak tree and fastened the other on the uh, other side of the engine. He said, stand back. We're going to fire this thing up. And I thought, well, he put it together without an instruction manual. I need to be about a, a hundred miles from this deal. <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't do that. So I got my courage up and said, okay, very weakly, I might add. And uh, he cranked her up. And I'm telling you, it looked like something right out of the bowels of hell. That fire spitting out of there and that poor oak tree just bark burning everywhere and <laughs> next thing you know here comes the sirens here comes the cops <laughs> <clears throat> well they knew art and they knew he was up to something and they really just wanted to see it more than anything and um they did and so we finally got uh, uh cooler heads prevailed and we took the uh engine down to uh General Electric, and they put it down in their test pit and cranked it up. It wasn't near as much fun as having a, <laughs> having, a, having, a, having that thing tied with cables tied around the trees. But that was the difference. You know, and Craig, he's a wonderful guy, but he did everything perfect. Yeah. Uh, you know, he had a lot more money. Goodyear put a lot more money in the effort than Firestone did with, with Craig. And... Um, so he was doing everything just the right way. He would have never gotten an engine like that. And um, he had a lot less horsepower than Art did. 
but still, he, the car was very streamlined. He had all kind of aerodynamics working on it. And back in those days, the one thing that worried everybody was what happened when you went through the sound of speed on the ground. Yeah. Uh, we knew what happened up in the air. Well, I talked to Chuck, had a great conversation with Chuck Yeager about him taking that X1 through the sound barrier. Uh, and I think he was about 55,000 feet or maybe higher when he did it. And he said it really wasn't much of anything. He made live boom noise, but I knew that was coming, so it didn't bother me. And I said, well, what do you think is going to happen when it's when the, you break it on the ground? He said, I have no idea. And that's what everybody said. All the aerodynamic guys and everybody else just shook their head and says, we have no idea. And, of course, they're looking at me like uh, probably the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to blow a tire. <laughs> and we don't understand why you guys are running tires either. And they told Breedlove the same thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, the land speed records today that when they run and they're up to what? What's the record now? Seven something? Yeah, the uh, the English have it back with Richard Noble's uh, Thrust SSC, which was that that was the car that broke the speed of sound. And, and I think where I know where you're going here, they're on basically solid, solid aluminum wheels, basically. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you, you and I said, well, we, we don't sell anything you don't put air in. <laughs> <laughs> Breedlove told I mean, uh, Goodyear told them the same thing, but uh, that was the weak link in the whole package was uh, was two things. One was tires. The second was what was going to happen when these guys went through the sound barrier. Now, a guy named, ran a sled <laughs> for the Air Force through the sound barrier, but it was attached to rails. And uh, we talked to them extensively about you know, what happened. And they said, well, it started like a machine gun going off. It started cracking when it entered that sound barrier. Oh, geez. And, uh, but that sled couldn't lift like one of these cars could. And it was not free. It was, you know, it was attached to the rails. So that was something that was puzzling all of us is what was going to happen when, uh, when they got there and then trying to figure out, well, what is the sound barrier? Yeah. Uh, y- you know, there, there, you can look it up in the dictionary and they'll tell you it's, just, you know, uh, 700 mile an hour or something like that. But it's really a combination, as you well know, from doing all this research you've done, it's a combination of, uh, the air temperature, humidity, altitude, etc. And at the salt flats, it was going to be much lower than the 700 miles an hour and probably somewhere in the, in the 600 plus range. And um, by that time, the record uh, was getting up there, you know, past 500. Yeah. And uh, I know when Art ran 500 the first time, I started hearing cracking noises. And the uh, thing uh, you know all about, most people don't, but they'll enjoy this, though, is that at the salt flats, you got to run uh, an average speed. You just can't go down and break the record on one run. Correct. And you got to, within an hour, turn around and, and run again and then uh, break the record. Well, if you've had to change diapers after the first run... <laughs> You probably are not going to run too fast the second run because it's a hairy deal. To I remember, I drove the chase car when he got over 500 the first time. Wow! And at that time, that is the only thing that was allowed within a thousand feet of the streamliner. And I had a, a Tony Triola who was a, a photographer for Sports Illustrated. Okay. And I had a doctor with me. Doctor was in the back seat, and. Uh, uh, Tony was in the front, and we were using a Utah Highway Patrol car. Was a Plymouth with a 426 Hemi engine. All right, we had a, we, we put tires on it like Art had on his uh, 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 his streamliner. Okay, because uh, you know we were going to only get up to about 140 or 45, and um, uh, we uh, the chase car. T- you, 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 the guy. We, the problem with the salt flats when we were out there, and of course it still is, is that at one time, I think the 
the salt flats was 25 miles long. Yes. As one, as the salt began to flood uh, at certain times of year, uh, you didn't have but a mile to get before you hit the flying mile. And uh, you wanted to have about four miles or three or four miles of running before you hit that flying mile to get speed up. And so if you got into a run as short as we did, I think one time we had to only had a mile. And I told Art, I begged him not to run. I said, Mark, that's just not enough. I said, you're going to have to. It had four stages afterburner. Yes. I said, you're going to have to go through the four stages afterburner before you get to the end of the flying mile. And that means you're going to have to run in the 700s just to get to a 500 and something average. And he didn't bat an eye. He said, oh, it's no problem. <laughs> and um, so uh, the one time that he didn't make it out there when he was trying to recapture the record after he lost it from Breed Love for the second time, I think it was, uh, I'm in the chase car, and all of a sudden, that car went up in the air. Oy. And by the time we took off, um, we were a mile ahead of him, and uh, we had a signal, and we would take off. And then <clears throat> when he figured we were about a mile down the flat, he would take off. Well, it took him no time to catch us. And when he passed us, I thought, this is not something a human beings <laughs> in because... He was making a tremendous amount of noise. He had hit the second stage of afterburner and fire was shooting out the back. And I thought, that's the devil himself in that car. That couldn't be anybody else. <laughs> then the car took off and went up in the air. And it probably went 100 feet in the air, 10 stories. Because um, I could see out of the front windshield. And, I, and it was, you know, very colorfully paint, painted oh my know, God. green and red yeah and i thought well, this is it but art always told me one thing because he, he had the driver's pod on the left side of the engine and he had another pod identical to it which somebody else could sit in if they wanted to uh on the right side and he said if i ever crash this thing look for the pod it won't be anything but a bunch of roll bars and he says, I built it that way. And he built it He built it himself. And all of a sudden, that car started disintegrating. Of course, you couldn't see anything because after the car came down. Oh, I'm sure just stuff was flying everywhere. Feet and dust up and... at that speed, it just started pencil rolling. And sheet metal and everything else, wheels and everything else is flying up through the air. When the dust settled, I'm looking for him. And I look for that pod. And I see one pod, and it's empty. And I thought, oh, my God. Yeah. And I looked at the – I finally found the other pod about a half mile away, and he was in it. And I thought, he's there's no way he could have survived that. And I got there with the doctor and the photographer. And, um, of course, Art was completely unconscious. And uh, we put him in the medvac airplane, and I got in there with him. And we took off for Salt Lake City, a hundred and some miles away, because that was the closest hospital. <clears throat> he got about, and the doctor was with us. We got about halfway down there in the plane, and Art woke up. There was no way anybody could go through something like that and wake up, <laughs> you know. And I thought, oh my God, at least he will see him with his last words. <laughs> Wasn't. We got him in the hospital. They put him through every kind of test they could put him through and here's a man that crashed at probably 720 plus and lived through it Unbelievable. as a matter of fact they never could really find anything wrong with him other than some really bad bruises and contusions from the seat belts and and all the other stuff but he made that pod a survivable capsule and that's what saved his life Amazing. And it was astonishing as the the Snell Foundation flew in from California the next morning. We were still in the hospital. Came up and grabbed me, and that they were real big into safety research then. It was a nonprofit outfit. And uh, they wanted to test him and everything else. And I went in to talk to Art, and he said, well, there's nothing to test. I want to go home. <laughs> I said, well. <laughs> 
at least you could do. I said, you, you survived what has been the worst automobile accident in the history of man. And they just want to see what's wrong with you. And they, he said, well, there's nothing wrong with me except what you see. I got a couple black eyes and I got a bloody lip. And, and bruises where my seatbelts were. Other than that, there ain't nothing wrong with me. And he wouldn't even let them test it, <laughs> <laughs> to, to their chagrin. Amazing. I, I did let him have, have his helmet because <laughs> they were real interested in, in uh, the survivability of that crash helmet. And um, so that's the kind of guy he was. He was just matter of fact about the whole thing. Like, you know, I made it. So if it did crash, I would survive. And he did. And we have seen several people lose their life out there trying yeah. to trying to do that. It's uh that's an incredible account uh of of what still I believe stands today as the worst survived car crash of all time. I think it was actually in the Guinness book at one point, it probably still is, that he had survived, you know, the fastest crash of in history there's one thing i have to ask you about that tim arfons told me i had to ask you about okay. and he, he wanted me to ask you about the story of art meeting muhammad ali <laughs> well we had broken the record and we'd been on our press tour but we didn't go overseas because breed love was back on the flats and it was customary that when your competitor was on the flats that you weren't there you either stayed in wendover seven miles away, or you went somewhere else. Well, uh, Breedlove's runs were rather studious and tedious, and I wasn't going to ask us to stay in uh, Wendover, which there's nothing there. Um, uh, well, there is in Nevada part of it, but in the Utah part where we stayed, it was uh, all Mormon, and uh, there was no activity of any gain there except, you know, except bringing a cup of coffee in the morning. And so I said, well, look, I got a friend that runs a casino down in uh, Vegas. Why don't we go down there and we'll put the uh, Green Monster uh, on the uh, at the front and let everybody see it. And they'll put us up till we need to come back up here. So we took it down there. And uh, we were out there one morning about 10 o'clock. And this was back when Vegas at 10 o'clock. No one was anywhere <laughs> if they were that was because they were coming in gotcha uh this was before your kind of average tourist would get get there so we were out there you know waxing the monster getting it cleaned up in front of the sands hotel the old sands hotels where it was and uh no one's out on the strip this bus came down and did a big u-turn i thought it was going to crash and drove right up to where we were, and the driver was no other than Ali. Yeah, he's driving a bus. He loved buses, <laughs> and so did Arfon. That's what he transported his car in, bus. And so Ali jumps out, and uh, he goes there. We thought I was Arfon at first, and I said, no, 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 that's Art right over there, because Art didn't pay any attention to it. <laughs> I'm not sure Art even knew who he was only recognizable face on the earth that everybody in the world knew he was, including the Pope. But Art, he he lived in a different world. And so I said, well, Art, this is, uh, at that time, Cassius Clay. He's world champion. Oh, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, I know who he is. And um, Ali was jumping up and down like a shortstop. He was so excited. And he said, uh, well, listen, I want to I wanna drive this thing down the strip. I said, what? Well, Art said, well, you can't exactly drive it down the strip because it's awful hard to start. We, we, he said, well, where's the starter? He said, well, we have to push a rod in the front of it and all that stuff because it's a jet engine. And <laughs> he never did. I said, well, go over and sit in it. And I'll let him, you know, I open the cockpit up and let him get in, which he did. He took a bunch of pictures. And then uh, uh, we got out. And he said, uh, well, what, you boys ain't doing nothing. I said, well, no, I'm really finished waxing the car. And he said, come on up and watch me work out. He says, uh, I forget who he's getting ready to fight. And um, so we went up to the place he was working out, and they had it all fixed up. You know, they had the ring in there. and uh, They had bleachers for people to sit in. There was a bunch of people watching him. So we went up in bleachers and sat down, and uh, 
Angelo Dundee was uh, Allie's trainer, and I'm a former boxer, so I was I, I was excited oh, you're in, about it. Yeah, you're in hog heaven right now, yeah. Yeah, so um, matter of fact, uh, Allie was one of the reasons why I had to quit, because uh, he was blocking me from making the Olympic team, and uh, I knew I couldn't whip him. Um, so about the fourth round, <clears throat> there was a, a black kid in the about seven years old and Allie got stopped his sparring much to his trainer's chagrin and brought the little black kid up there and uh, he got down on his knees and let the black kid knock him out <laughs> and uh, uh, Bundini his buddy uh, counted him out and then gave the kid a trophy and he says uh, this is the never weight champion of the world <laughs> and he, uh, the, the kid didn't know what to say. He was so astonished that he could be part of it. Then about the 12th round, <clears throat> Ali gets bored again. And he's been through four sparring partners at this point. And he says, uh, now, folks, he says, and Angelo's over there just raising cane because he wants him to get back in boxing again. But Ali, he's running the show. He says, now, <laughs> he says, you think I'm the fastest man in the world? He says, you're wrong. He says, we got a man here that's faster than I am, and I want to bring him up. And uh, his name's Art Arfon. And so Art went up in the ring reluctantly, and uh, <clears throat> he brought another trophy out and gave it to to Art because Art wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. Yeah, right. He put gloves on or anything like that. So that was our... Uh, Wow. Connection with Ali. And of course, we met him a number of other times after that. <laughs> and he was, he's always wanting to, to drive the car. And I think that if we'd give him a chance to do it, he would have. He probably would have. <laughs> he probably would have. Uh, it might not be a Las Vegas today, but yeah. it would have been. <laughs> it would have gone interesting to. Yeah, it would have been a glorious end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to see it so we had quite a time with it that's amazing i um i appreciate the time and and i appreciate you you know painting a little bit more of a picture for us of this guy that i you know he's he's such a fascinating man to to kind of observe his history and, and to talk about and just to just to understand how gutsy he was in such a quiet way and, and that's to me that's his the most impressive part of his legacy is you know and i'm taking nothing away from breed love but breed love was much more had much more showman built into him and art had none of that. And, you know, the, the, to me, the most impressive part of the guy was just how quiet he was and how he let everything he did speak for himself rather than himself speaking on the accomplishments. Now, nah, you know, we'd go into a restaurant somewhere like in New York city and, uh, sit there at, at the Lashana Claire, which is not there anymore, but it used to be run by a guy, Renee Dreyfus, who was a great F1 driver. Uh, from France and Art sitting in there and uh, Renee was delighted to have him have have him in there and uh, Art said well have they got any bologna sandwiches I said uh, well uh, I don't think the French eat this kind of bologna we do <laughs> uh. Renee came up and made him a bologna sandwich and uh Art said, that's kind of eating I like to do. <laughs> Amazing. One of the things that Humpy Wheeler laughed about when I asked him during that interview was about the sound of Art's voice used in the film Challenge made by Firestone after the 1965 triumph of Art running over 430 miles an hour and regaining the record again. Well, I'm going to show you the difference here between Art Arafon's real voice and the voice they implied was his later on in the show. What's interesting is they use Art's real voice in one section. They just never credit it as being him. And then when they go to this second, much more deep and manly sounding voice, um, they kind of in imply the fact that it's Art speaking, not someone speaking on his behalf. So right now, this is the actual voice of Art Arafon speaking about the preparation of the car before it goes down the course in the same film. Greco. As usual, we had an hour to service the car. We're very careful with the kerosene. We strain it all to a cloth to be sure no dust gets in it. 
the crew needed refueling too, but I wasn't hungry. Too much to think about. So you got that voice, and this is the way this voice was described. It was kind of high-pitched. The guy wasn't, you know, necessarily someone who loved public speaking, and he was kind of reticent to do stuff like this. So you heard him very mechanically, methodically going through the steps of how they prepared the car. They're kind of basic steps as far as straining the fuel and all. Now, this is the voice that Firestone employed to be art and make you assume it was art speaking when he was making a run down the course. Tell me that there's not too much of a difference here. The noise from the jet engine is deafening. There's a tremendous vibration. The heat is intense, but I don't feel it. Visibility is not very good, but I don't think about that. Everything blurs going by. My eyes try to focus on the black line ahead. The car screams and the wheels and the salt make wild noises. I keep waiting for something to happen, and it seems like, I don't like an eternity. It all happens so fast that it's hard to catch up with the next second. Before we get into the final end of this story and we get into 1966, I do want to play one last piece of brilliant audio from the challenge film as made by Firestone. The the narrator of this is a famous actor named Everett Sloan. Sloan is a guy who appeared in like 100 plus movies uh, well into the 50s and 60s. His voice was used on a lot of stuff even in his his later years into the 70s I believe but uh, he was a, a character actor that appeared in movies with Humphrey Bogart and a billion other people and his very distinctive vocal style certainly lends itself to this dramatic film and its uh, ultimate climax of art setting the record. So let's listen to the ultimate climax here of Art Arfons setting this record, claiming things back for Firestone and achieving not his fastest speed ever in this film, but one of the fastest ever in his 536 mile an hour triumph. Arfons is on his way. The crew, dedicated, loyal. The ones who believe in Arpans rush to his aid. None is necessary. He is safe. Emotion sweeps everyone. They laugh, and grown men cry. The speed is released for the second run. Five, five, nine miles per hour. Combined with the first run of 515 miles an hour, it gives an average of 536.71 miles an hour. A new world land speed record. Today, Arthur Arfons is the fastest man in the world on wheels. Pretty great to listen to that audio and just kind of hear everything that happened and uh, understand that that 536 was a triumphant moment. Now remember, Breedlove would come back and knock the record up to 555, 556, and then later that year, Arfons would come back and he would knock it up to 576, and then finally Breedlove returned at the end of 1965 and cranked it all the way up over 600 miles an hour. And this was a tough thing for Arfons to swallow because there was no opportunity to go back. And in 1966, he returns, and he returns in a very interesting fashion. People thought that he was going to go and take his car apart and make all kinds of changes. And the reality is he didn't really do anything to change it. Made some minor tweaks, but other than that, the Green Monster of 1966 was the Green Monster of 1965. The title of this story written on November, or published, I should say, November 28, 1966 in Sport Illustrate, Sports Illustrated, 
written by a guy named Bob Autumn, who is a spectacular writer. Uh, Bob Autumn has since passed, but his motorsports writing, which you can find in the Sports Illustrated Vault online, is astonishingly good. The title of this story is called Duel with Death on the Salt. On Monday night, Art Arfons is sitting in one of the booths at the Western Cafe with a dusty plaid shirt over his fireproof racing coveralls, spooning up thick homemade soup. First thing I do when I get back off from the salt flats every night, he says, is to call my wife June in Akron, and every night the first thing she says to me is, don't go fast and come on home. Boy, I sure didn't go fast enough to scare anybody today. This is his idea of not fast enough. He's made three runs on the desert outside of Wendover, Utah, and on the last one, at 3.55 p.m., he hit 561.62 miles an hour through the measured mile. The world land speed record is 600.601 miles per hour. I gotta set the record tomorrow, he says, because you know why? Well, every night we have two guys from the crew sleep out there in the flats with the car to sort of keep our company, and tomorrow's my turn. Gets pretty damn cold out there. Craig Breedlove and the Spirit of America hold the record now, but Craig and Art have swapped it. Arfons has had it three times before, 434, 536, and then 576.553. Since getting it back last year, Breedlove has indicated he thinks this whole series is too dangerous a game. He does not care to come back unless Arfons breaks his record again. But 40 years old, a handsome man with curling black hair and Indian cheekbones, Arfons is working at doing just that with a frightening sense of purpose. He has installed dual rear wheels on the monster and cut away the rear wheel coverings to make room for the thick, fat tires. In the 7 a.m. light of a Tuesday morning, the crew ties the monster to a station wagon with a canvas strap and tugs it out onto the salt flats. Art walks around it while the Firestone engineers kneel down by the tires, testing air pressure. Let's go, you guys, he says. Ed Snyder and Bud Groff, his crewman and best friends, stand near him. Groff is the only man allowed to zip up his lucky jacket. Groff puts down the green carpet that Arfon stands on while he changes from boots to his driving shoes. Groff always wipes the bottom of Art's shoes so he won't get any salt into the cockpit. Arfon settles down and hooks up his shoulder straps. He is so tightly wedged in of the top of the cockpit canopy when it is closed, presses down hard on his crash helmet. He nods at the crew, and they fire up the car. Ahead of Arfon's lies a 10-mile-long black line painted across the salt, the entire straightaway is 12 miles long, and although he could roll further if necessary into a salt slushy area at either end. At mid-course is the measured mile, where electric eyes catch the car as it streaks past. The United States Auto Club timing equipment is in a small house trailer off to one side. Alone now, sitting to the right of the line with his left wheels almost on it, he revs up the monster. The engine spews boiling air that makes the mountains in the background dance in a shimmery haze. Art lifts his foot off the brake. The monster leaps away, leaving a dull roar behind it, and then behind that, a strong thump of air, and then a sound that runs along the ground after the car is gone. Flashing over the horizon, trailing a plume of salt, the monster vanishes. At the far end, Arfon gets out of the car and walks around. The crewmen have come up, slamming on the brakes and skidding their cars into a ragged semicircle around the monster. They gather in tightly, but nobody asked Art how fast he went. This is bad form. Everybody knows it was not fast enough, and then across the salt, wavering against the horizon, a white station wagon starts to take shape. Rolling toward them is Joe Petrali, the USAC's chief timer, with the official times written on a scrap of paper torn from a yellow-ruled legal pad. He gets out and walks directly to Arfons, and the crew gathers around in a tight knot. This is Petrali's big moment on each run, and he gets to stage it for special effect. He will not report to anybody but Arfons. You were 436 through the mile, Petrelli says, and 394 through the kilo. He does not add any editorial comment. It's enough. Arfon nods and turns away, kicking the salt with his toe. Then Arfons walks back and explains to his crew, I shut her off in the middle of the mile because I didn't seem to have it. Everybody nods and goes back to work. They turn the monster around and Arfons tries again, 524 through the mile, and 507 through the kilo, and then again, 541 through the mile, 555 through the kilo. He's done for the day. At dinner in the State Line Hotel and Casino, Arfons thinks things out and makes some decisions. He'll go out at daybreak the next day in the still morning air, and he'll start further back at the two-mile mark, giving the monster a three-mile run into the first mi measured mile clock. He'll throw on the second stage afterburners. The part about the afterburners worries the crew. These are jet nozzles that pour raw fuel into the engine and give it absolute stark acceleration. Art has never before had two burners lighted, only one. Everybody assembles in the salt flats in the blackness of a 5 a.m. morning on Thursday. 
By 8 a.m., the monster is on the line, pointed north. The crew is stationed down the line, and every man tensed up. Down below the measured mile, Hoskins and Sports Illustrated photographer Eric Schweikert are hovering in a helicopter, waiting to take photos. At 8.03, the monster rolls away. Arafans lifts his foot off the brake, switches on the afterburners, and suddenly, the car coughs up a stream of yellow fire, gives a huge rolling thump, and roars away. Arfons blasts through the first mile at 585 and through the kilo at 589, still accelerating. Down course a few hundred yards outside of the flags, he hits 610 miles per hour. In the copter, the photographer sees the monster drift to the left of the black line, and then, sickeningly, it veers to the right and starts to roll over. The car was exploding into pieces at all sides, then a parachute blossomed out of the smoke. The car went end over end twice. It landed on its side and began to slide, twistingly, it slid forever, kicking up salt. Hosking slams the copter down. In the wreckage, Arfons lies in the cockpit, his face streaming blood. The canopy has been torn away and groaning. He is trying to unfasten his shoulder belt straps. A strong chromoly steel bar is twisted across Art's chest, pinning him to the wreckage. Hosking grabs it with both hands and with one giant heave, pulls it away and bends it straight into the air. The rest of the crew comes spinning up. Someone handed me an axe, Hosking said, and I chopped the bar away at the weld. Then I reached in and got my hands under Art's shoulders, and they felt mushy, like both his collarbones were busted. Smoke was coming from the wreckage, and he kept putting his hands up to his face. Firestone Public Relations man Jim Cook, who's gone white with shock, helps carry the stretcher to the ambulance plane and climbs in. He's sure Arfons is dead. What do you think, asked, Cook asked the doctor. From under the mummy-like wrapping of blankets, Arfons speaks. I think I'm all right. Will you call June and tell her I'm okay? She didn't want me to go that fast. Cook, stunned, says, uh, yes. The monster is a ruin. Everything is broken. Sections of the body have been peeled away grotesquely. The iron insides and wires are spilled out. Along the salt flats behind the monster is painted fresh streaks of red and green paint and a path of umber. Bits of wreckage are strewn in a two-mile line. The steering wheel and airplane type is wrenched upside down. He could have had the wreckage, Joe Petrali said back at the flats. Now nobody has, he now has no one to show the slip of paper to. He would have stepped her up just a little on the return run and he could have had it. Back at the hospital, Arfons twists uncomfortably in bed. The thing that saved me is 15 pounds I gained from eating too much. I was crammed into that cockpit so tight I couldn't even move a muscle. Are you there, Jim? Cook nods and touches one of our Art's forearms. Leather jacket saved me, you see. Not a scratch on my arms or my body, right? Right, says Cook, blinking his eyes. Jim? I'm still here. Hey, Jim, I think maybe I'm going to fly back home instead of drive, huh? Hell of an idea, says Cook. This is not the end of the story. The world land speed record is still breed loves, but it's not safe. Arfons will be back again as soon as he can assemble a new monster. I know June's against it, he says, and it will take a little while to get her all calmed down, but he shrugs like a man who aches all over. Well, damn, I got this other jet engine in my garage, and... The story ends there by Bob Ottoman for... The man known as Art Arfons, the story on the Bonneville Salt Flats pretty much ends there. Arfons would return to the Bonneville Salt Flats in the late 1980s, in the early 90s, to make some record attempts in a car he had built himself, of course, for very little money, in the same shop he built the Green Monster. But Art's motorsport story after Bonneville in 1966 was centered around the drag strip again, and it was certainly centered around the world of pulling. Arfons became one of the great tractor pullers in the world. He had, of course, turbine-powered pulling tractors. He pulled with his daughter, Dusty, as well as his son, Tim, became a very uh, highly sought-after puller and performer at events with turbine-powered vehicles. Tim has gone on to make a life for himself, a very successful life in the world of turbine applications. But Art Arfons really never again became a factor in land speed racing after this time. That's not to say he didn't still like going fast, though because there was another green monster constructed, one that was a virtual identical copy of the first one. And Arfons traveled the world with this car, taking it to England and other places, and setting records and making runs down drag strips. He would make a lot of runs down drag strips with his jet-powered cars during the 50s and 60s, but during the very early 70s when he had the green monster out again, he actually went over to England with this car, and we have some audio of that that we'll listen to in just a moment. Arfons' story in my mind, isn't a failure. Yes, he crashed with that horrendous 600-mile-an-hour speed, but ultimately he walked away from this car that he built himself after suffering the fastest car crash in human history, a record that still stands in the Guinness Book of World Records today. 
His pulling career has landed him in the National Tractor Pullers Hall of, Hall of Fame. He has uh, been inducted into the Drag Racing Hall of Fame, and basically he is a land speed racing Hall of Famer. Everything this guy did, he did it on his own, with his own two hands, and to a level that nobody expected possible. An amazing man, an incredible story, and one of the longest podcasts we'll probably ever make here, but I think it was worth the time. Art Arfons is a personal hero to me because he was unpretentious, he did all the work himself, and he over performed everybody's expectations over the course of his career, whether it was in a pulling tractor, a drag race car, or a land speed racing machine. A sincere thanks to the guests on this podcast, which would have been far less dimensional if they had not appeared, whether it's Brett Kepner with a great drag racing history, Tim Arfons with a great personal history of his dad, Samuel Hawley with his great in-depth knowledge of the battle between Craig Arfons, Craig Breedlove, and Art Arfons on the Bonneville Salt Flats, or Humpy Wheeler, motorsports legend, filling in gaps and filling us in on the color of Art Arfon's life. This podcast, I hope, has informed you in ways that you never knew about Art Arfon's and perhaps other places can't bring you this type of stuff. Read the Sports Illustrated stories. Read Sam Hawley's book. Read everything Humpy Wheeler has ever read or said. And pay attention to Brett Kepner when he speaks because the man knows of what he is talking about. Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out Dorkomotive.com. If you love this podcast, there's a whole lot more there, and there's a whole lot more where you found this one. We're going to continue to drop fresh episodes on automotive history, automotive competition, and cool automotive people, and like in this podcast, the intersection of those three things. I will now leave you with the sounds of Art Arfons attacking the Bonneville Salt Flats at 576 miles an hour in late 1965. Go! This episode of the Dorkomotive Podcast is being presented by Nitroactive.net. Nitroactive.net carries the best in nostalgia West Coast drag strip t-shirts as well as hot rod and car culture t-shirts from places like Moon Eyes, Laid Back, Lucky 13, SoCal Speed Shop, Hollywood Hot Rods, and more. They also have a massive inventory of vintage collectible hot rod, car craft, hop-up, popular hot rodding, drag racing, super stock, and drag illustrated magazines, as well as classic and vintage photos. Visit NitroActive.net for all your vintage hot rod and drag racing needs. Use promo code DORK and check out and save 10% on your next purchase at NitroActive.net.